we should start. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, I am really happy to welcome Professor Roberto Bertosi, who will be leading this tutorial today. Uh, Professor Bertosi is with the uh, business, Schema Business School in Montreal, Canada, and it's very, it fits very well in the database community, which is behind the theory of repair. And uh, very recently, uh, Professor Bertosi and his colleagues do a connection between the theory of repair and the theory of causality. And this is exactly what this tutorial is going to be about today. Please remember that this is a two-part tutorial, the third part in the morning and the second part in the afternoon. Uh, thank you again, Professor Bertosi, for being here. Uh, the floor is here. Okay, thanks a lot for the for your nice introduction. Thanks a lot for having invited me. I'm also to with Boris. Um, they accepted my, my tutorial, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, uh, I have to admit I changed a bit uh, maybe the title or the content somewhere in the way, but I mean it's, I'm going to just, still stay around as the original subject, so don't worry too much about that. And the other thing is I may have more material than I can cover, but the slides will be available, so I might skip some de details. I mean, uh, and we can take a look at them afterwards. I mean, uh, so I will make the slides. I mean, they are already available at, at, the, at this web page, but also at my web page over here. Uh, actually, my web page is hosted by Carlton University, where I used to work. I retired from Carlton University, a uh, professor, and now uh, recently I joined the Schema Business School, that is a French uh, private. Uh, this is cool. Uh, and the Schema Opener Research uh, Lab in Montreal, and that is where I'm working today. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, you can interrupt me if there are questions. I mean, no problem. As I said, I'm not really not going to be able to cover all the slides I have, but I mean, uh, doesn't matter. I mean, you will have access to them, and they are very self-contained, as you will notice. So it's not a big deal. We can go through the whole. Material. Okay, I'm going to uh, split this presentation into two parts. Uh, in the morning, I'm going to talk basically about explanations in data management. In the afternoon, about explanations in machine learning. Uh, but the two things are, are connected. I mean, so uh, you will see some subjects that we are going to present now, they will, will show up uh, also later today. Okay, so let me start with an example. We have a, a database here, very simple database, and then we are asking, I mean, a query, uh, are there pairs of official stores in a receiving relationship? This is supposed to be the, 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 the table of official stores, I mean, uh, and then you have this uh, receiving relationship between different stores, and we are uh, trying to find out, I mean, if this query is satisfied. Yeah. Uh, so if we write uh, the query in visual, uh, relational calculus uh, kind of, I mean, uh, you will have this conjecture query, I mean, you are trying to find, I mean, uh, stores that are associated to receive, and the two of the two of them belong to the table on the right hand side, yeah? And this uh, query happens to be true in the database, I mean, the database satisfies the query, and this is the usual notation that we, we use for noting again that the database satisfies the query, it makes it true, yeah? Uh, and now the question is, uh, what that was cost the query to be true? I mean, you know something is true, the, 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 the database system will say yes, and that you want to find out more about this. So, and also, if we are talking about causes, it's very natural to talk about how strong the causes are for a query answer. You know? uh, so, for example, we, we, we expect the tuples uh, this receive S3, S3, S4, S3, uh, so in this case, the, the, the store is uh, receiving something from the same store. I mean, why not? That is also possible. So this tuple participates in the satisfaction of the query. If you combine with this uh, value over here, also receive S4, S3, because you have S4 here, that, that's the joint here, and this S3, that's the joint with this one. So you have at least those two uh, uh, facts or tuples that uh, contribute to making the, the query true. Yeah? So this would be what we would consider explanations for a query result. I mean, there are tuples that are participating in making the query true in the data. Yeah? Uh, so we might 
trying to do other things. I mean, around explanations, like uh, for example, trying to find uh, explanations for violation of semantic constraints, empirical constraints, uh, uh, view contents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm going to stay around queries. But you can imagine that this can be extended to other situations. Yeah? And the idea is that the database system should be able to provide explanations of this kind. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, and of course, <laughs> what is an explanation? Explanations come, come in different uh, shapes, in different forms. I mean, a, a whole area of what is an explanation is actually even a philosophical question, uh, and also has been investigated quite deep, deeply and for a long time in artificial intelligence. So we have to come up with a proper definition of explanation that is useful in this case. Um, so uh, we are going to talk about basically possible explanations. Fossil explanation is a very particular kind of explanation. Uh, they are not the only one, only ones. Uh, so, so and we want to model, we want to specify, and compute causes. I mean, mod modeling means basically giving a proper definition, hopefully having a logical specification of a cost, and also we want to compute them. That is the most important thing that we might want to do in the context of data management. Yeah? Uh, so, a large part of, of our research, uh, recent research for the last uh, few years, uh, has turned around causality and the use of causality in different ways, both in data management and machine learning. And in the afternoon, you will see more about this in the context of machine learning. Uh, so, but just for the gist, uh, here we are in a machine learning setting. We have an entity. It's a, <laughs> an entity that is represented as a record of feature values. So this entity is John, who is uh, 18, he's a plumber, he makes 70k, he lives in Harlem, etc. Et other feature values. So the, the, this entity is his private feature values. Um, so for name, name, age, activity, and so on. Yeah? And then this entity requests, requests a loan from the bank. Yeah? Uh, and the bank happens to use a classifier that could be a very complicated classifier that not even the bank understands. Uh, and, and basically, the bank is going to give an answer. And so the classifier says, no, this is a potentially bad uh, client, so we are not granting the, the, the loan to this person. You can give you 70 k if it's a bad client. Come on. It's <laughs> 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 hardly OK. Uh, well, yeah, so to make the situation more striking, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, we need some drama here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the client asks why, and actually today the clients are, I mean, they are invited to, to request some explanations of it. They're not just going to be happy with a negative answer, and that's it. I mean, no. So, uh, actually, there is legislation in place in different countries. Uh, around this kind of a uh, use of an intelligent system that we classify, right? I mean, so what kind of explanation should we provide in this case for the rejection of the loan request? How is it provided and using what? Yeah, that is uh, the main, these are the questions, fundamental questions. One possibility is to use uh, responsibility as a score. So I'm going to concentrate and in this tutorial on explanations given in terms of a scores, I mean numbers that say how important a feature value is for a, an answer from an intelligent system, how uh, important a, a tuple is for a query answer, and also explanations given as a scores, numerical scores. Those, those are not the only kind of not the only kind of explanation that we find in the literature, but uh, well, I have to narrow the scope of this uh, tutorial, and that's what I have been doing most of the time. Okay, responsibility is one of those scores that come from causality. It comes from causality. Yeah. And causality has been developed in AI for three decades, decades or, or so. I mean, actually, even from that, and also it's a very important philosophical subject. In particular, we're going to talk, we're going to talk about actual causality. Actual causality. That is a particular incarnation of a uh, incarnation of uh, cosmology, uh, and also it comes with this, as I said before, a quantitative notion of responsibility, a measure of causal contribution of causal strength. Uh, it is based on the notion of counterfactual interventions. Uh, 
what are counterfactual interventions? They are, of course, people are talking all the time about counterfactual intervention in the context of explainable AI. Basically, they are hypothetical changes of values in the causal model that, uh, that are made in order to detect other possible changes. I mean, they are the kind of what would happen if we change this? I mean, this feature value, for example, would, for example, the now the loan request be accepted? Uh, things like that. So, or if I change this tuple or remove this tuple from the database, is the query still to be satisfied or not? So things like that. So it's a hypothetical game, right? Uh, and by doing that, we can hopefully going to be in position to identify actual costs. Yeah? That is the intuition. Yeah, so for example, like I said, that's the definition of a database tuple that validates the query and so on. That's a change of this feature value need to enable yes. Yeah? Um, okay. So we have been investigating actual causality and responsibility in data management and machine learning based classification. Uh, we have investigated different aspects of it, so semantics, computational mechanism, the intrinsic complexity, how difficult it is to obtain process and compute responsibility. Uh, Logic-based classification, I'm going to talk about this, about logic-based classification, but I have uh, done quite a lot of work on using, using asset programming to specify counterfactual interventions and computing a cost of responsibility. Also, this logic-based specification can be used for reasoning, etc. But I'm not going to talk about this today, uh, about this part of logic-based specification of reasoning. Uh, uh, and also, there are, all, also a, there are other explanation scores, also known as in the AI literature as attribution scores. Uh, uh, they, in general, attribution scores, as I just said about the responsibility, they assign numbers to, uh, for example, data tables or feature values to capture their causal or more generally, generally explanatory strength. Yeah? Uh, some of them in data management and machine learning are responsibility in its original and general, generalized version. We notice with some uh, uh, colleagues and co-authors that we have to extend the notion of responsibility in order to provide a good model for certain applications, and we show this. Also, the causal effect sport that has its roots in causality in observational studies, mostly, and it goes back to the work of you know, Rubin, etc. So this is something more or less established in the literature, but we use, I think, for the first time, this in the context of data management, and we'll show this as well. And also the shape value. The shape value has become quite prominent, uh, and, and in, in machine learning, in AI, it takes the uh, form of SHA, that is a well-established uh, attribution score. And I'm going to talk about this this afternoon. Okay. So this is something I'm going to, to, to cover in this uh, tutorial. Okay. Uh, so basically, as I said, uh, in the, the afternoon, this is what I, what I will try to cover this morning. Uh, this part of it is in the, in the afternoon, I'm going to talk more, mostly about Shapley and those things in database and, and machine learning uh, as well. Yeah? Uh, uh, there are two papers that are, can be found at the end of the presentation that are, the, I would say, companion papers submitted to this tutorial, where it's published in the proceedings. The other one was uh, published uh, in the proceedings of Das de Avancé, so, so I think the two papers together are the papers basically support this tutorial and provide much more material and references. Okay. okay, let's go back then to the problem of causality in databases, hoping to have motivated hoping to have motivated the subject. So causal explanation for the core result. This is the, something that was introduced by Alexander Meliu, Wolfgang Gatterbauer, and Dan Suchu in 2010 in a VLDB paper. We just started from this. Yeah, I was, I was actually was visiting Dan Sushu in, in Seattle uh, when they had published this uh, very recently, and then we were started talking about this. So I became very much motivated by the subject, and I started making some uh, contributions in the, this direction. So we have the relational instant B and a Boolean conjunctive query, and basically a query without three variables. If we want to have three variables, we can always test a poss possible answer instantiate the query with the possible answer and do the same game. So there is no loss of generality if we use 
queries with all variables, right? So basically, only in the sense of they have the answer yes or no. So a tuple T in the database is a counterfactual cost for the query to be true. I mean, we are assuming that the data is negative for the true. So a tuple is a counterfactual cost for the query to be true. Uh, uh, if, uh, well, if I remove the tuple from the database, the query is no longer true. That is the, most, the strongest cost that you can find. If you say, yes, remove that tuple, invalidates the query. Of course, in practice, that is seldom uh, going to happen. Uh, you need other changes in addition to the deletion of T, for example. Why deletions? Because they are considering conjunctive queries, basically. Uh, basically, so you are not going to change anything by adding new tuples. So you basically you remove tuples or you change that to this value. But adding things doesn't change anything with respect to conjunctive queries that are monotone. Uh, that's why that is implicit in conjunctive query. Okay. And now the tuple is an actual cost, it's a more general notion, for the query to be true. If there is a set of tuples that accompany tau, it's a set of companions, I mean, to do tau, such that tau is a counterfactual cost for the query when you we have already deleted the tuples in this set, continuously set. Uh, gamma. That means I take gamma, I take D, I remove tuple from gamma, the query is still true there, but if I further delete tau, then the query becomes false. Yeah? So that means tau requires other tuples to be removed from the database in order to invalidate the query. It alone will not do that. Well, of course, gamma can be the empty set, but we fall back to this case of the factual tau. So this solution that was introduced by Halper and Pearl, 2001, uh, the official version and general version is 2005. Uh, and now the responsibility can be measured in terms of the sizes of these contingency sets, how many additional tuples we need to remove in order to invalidate the query, yeah? in addition to the tuple that had in tau. Yeah? So basically the responsibility of an actual cost tau is given by one over this uh, denominator, that is uh, the size of the minimum, the, the minimum continuous set for tau. Yeah? So you want to remove as few tap, additional tuples as possible. Yeah? In that way, you're really capturing how relevant is tau for the query results, and this is the responsibility you for. So this gamma could be empty. When it is empty, basically you have responsibility one, that is the case of the counterfactual cost, and this is the best cost that you can find. Yeah? The maximum extent for responsibility is one. Otherwise, you have to divide by this the minimum contingency set, minimum in size. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so high responsibility doubles provide more interesting explanation. Yeah? Uh, uh, responsibility, by the way, was introduced in this paper by Stockler and Halper in 2004. We okay? I uh, will give an example. Okay, uh, so here we have a database, again, uh, more or less as before. Uh, we have again the same kind of query here as I had before. Uh, we have a join. Here the, data, the database makes the query true. Yeah, okay. two different combinations. This, for example, combined with this and this, the join here and join here, and so on. Okay. So what are the causes for Q to be true in the database? Uh, well, S A three is a counterfactual cause for Q. If I remove this tuple from the database, there is no way, I hope, unless I made a mistake, to make the join true. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very strong tuple. Yeah. If you remove it, you are not going to be able to Satisfy the join over there. Yeah. Okay, so the responsibility is then is one over one plus the cardinality of the empty set is the counterfactual cost. What about this one? R A4, A3, A4, A3. If I remove this one, the question is the query invalidated 
Uh, apparently, I still, well, obviously, I can still satisfy the, the query because I can still do the join to this one, for example, right? Like a 3A3, a 3A3, a 3A3. So there are other combinations. So this, uh, the deletion of this tuple alone will not invalidate the query. Yeah? It's an actual cost, but it has a, with a contingency set of this one. So I have to additionally remove one possibility at least, is to remove this additional tuple, and then I will not be in position to satisfy the query. So if I delete this alone, the query is still true. If I delete this one in addition, the query is not only true, and that means I have a continuous set of size one. Uh, okay, are we fine? Okay, so the responsibility in this case is one half then. One over one plus one, yeah? It, 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 uh, so the smallest continuous sets are all size one. It doesn't matter, the importance is the important thing is how small the contingency set can be. Yeah. Uh, and again, you can also find other causes uh, similarly, similar kind of reasoning. These are also actual causes with responsibility one half. You need to remove additional tuples and then two in order to invalidate the query. So this is the idea. So this looks uh, very simple. Uh, uh, nice definition. Uh, it has been generalized in different ways to more general context of causality. Uh, but that I think it's complicated. So, so, uh, causality theory is pretty much why the, the result is not empty, right? Th this is pretty much the idea. What? If, because, for example, if I add A1 to S, then suddenly the middle tuple of R is also part of the, of the answer. So I, I could also you know, insert the data value in the data value. Yeah, but the query is already true. I mean, you want to. Okay, so, so basically the idea of explanation, definition of explanation is no empty result. I mean, the, the, the bottom line. What makes the result no empty? Well, you can decide. I mean, basically, what I'm saying, really. Here we are assuming that uh, we, we have a query that is satisfied and want to find answers. That is literature on what happened the other, otherwise. I mean, when you don't get a result, yeah, you want an explanation as well. And then in okay. that case, you will play the game that you're proposing. Okay. So, but I'm, yeah, but I have to narrow down. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, 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 but, but you're right. I mean, yeah, I mean, here I'm assuming the query is true and I want to see what are the causes. But the, the, the other problem would be the query is false. I don't want, I want to see what is missing in the data. Right? And that is another parallel game that you can play. You are completely right. So I should have said that. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, well, of course, this uh, definition is a mathematical definition, of course, but you want to put this uh, in, in practice, right? want to compute causes. I mean, so how difficult it is doing this, I mean, obtaining causes, computing responsibility scores, and so on, these are things that are important. So computational problems, what kind of computational problems we have? Well, computing causes is the most immediate I mean, problem that comes to our mind. Deciding if a tuple is a cause is a decision problem, that's not a computational problem. Uh, computing responsibilities is also national. To do computing most responsible causes because they are often to be considered to be the best explanations, uh, and deciding if a couple has a responsibility of all the person's threshold. I mean, it is high enough. I mean, for example, these are all things that, uh, and these problems are really uh, based on reduction. Yeah? So, there is, today there is a rather complete uh, complexity picture for conjunctive queries and union of conjunctive queries. Yeah? Uh, I'm going to I'm going to mention a few results. Uh, so these, the results have been obtained mostly by the connection between causality and database repairs. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about database repairs, but it's a, I mean, at least in my case, it's an older subject. I have worked quite a lot in, in the area of database repairs. And the connection uh, between these two areas actually gave us the possibility of obtaining different complex results. We exploited that connection. Uh, uh, and also, causality and consistency based diagnosis, that is an area of artificial intelligence, of knowledge representation, 
that was introduced mainly by Ray Leiter in the late 80s, and uh, he introduced the notion of consistency-based diagnosis, and in a paper that we wrote a few years ago with a PhD student of mine, Alex Alini, we established a very close connection between consistency-based diagnosis and causality, and we could exploit consistency-based diagnosis to obtain some results of causality. There are many things that can be that are still to be explored, and I'm working on them in this moment. I'm going to talk mainly about the connection with database repairs. Yeah. So database repairs in a nutshell uh, is about the following. This is something that uh, we introduced uh, long ago in POTS 99 with Marcelo Arenas and uh, Ian Komiski, uh, notion of database repair, consistent query answering. The idea is as follows. I mean, basically we have a database uh, that does not satisfy a given set of integrity constraints. We post a query to the database, and then the question is, well, what are the semantically correct answers to the query from this database that happens not to satisfy the constraint? Yeah? So we will, in some sense, to obtain meaningful answers, even in the presence of a, a database that is inconsistent. Yeah? That it was there main motivation and in order to attack to formulate the problem to attack the problem we came up with the notion of database repairs but basically so here we have a bunch of alternative databases to this one over the same schema the schema and then the repairs of the database are all consistent they all satisfy the constraints and the important thing is that they minimally differ from the original database don't want to change things too much in order to satisfy the constraint. But you may have a whole collection of repairs, not only one way of recovering consistency. So basically, posing the query here, trying to obtain meaningful answer, uh, can be stated as a problem of querying with the same query simultaneously a whole class of repairs of the digital database. And whatever is true in the whole class of repairs is what is semantically correct uh, with relation to the query that we are posing. Yeah? Of course, there are different repair semantics. Repairs can be obtained by different kind of uh, database actions or transactions. Uh, in this context, what uh, is important for us uh, in terms of analyzing the connection with society has to do mostly with double deletions, that, uh, which works well when we have certain class of constraints. For example, here, I have in this example, two denial constraints. Yeah? These are prohibitions. Basically, join, certain joints are prohibited. Yeah? You don't want to make those two joints true. Yeah? These are constraints. Yeah? So you don't want this joint to happen. Yeah? So basically, these, these are negations of basically conjunctive queries, as you can see. Negation of conjunctive queries. Then basically, you can restore, I mean, consistency by deleting double. Okay? Deleting double. You can also play the game of changing that to the value by a stick to deleting tabs. So this is a, uh, my database. I can, in this case, there are violations because I can make a join, for example, this one with this one over here will satisfy this part, this join, A, A, B, and so on, B, uh, uh, E, uh, uh, maybe not. Oh yeah, yeah, this one with this one. So, yeah. So but the two constraints are violated. Yeah. Okay. So uh, subset repairs. So this is the one one slide about uh, repairs that we have. Subset repairs are basically maximal consistent sub instances. Maximally maximal consistent sub instances. I mean, I'm deleting double, but I want to delete as uh, few tuples as possible under set inclusion. So these are two repairs. In this case, I deleted one of these tuples, the PA. With this, it's good enough to restore consistency in this case. In this case, I am keeping these two, and I am deleting these two over here. So here I have uh, basically two deletions, the deletion of this and this. Here I have the deletion of uh, this one. Yeah? So these are two repairs. Uh, that are minimal with respect to set inclusion, in the sense that this is not included here and this is not included here. 
they are incompatible in terms of inclusion. Yeah? However, one of them is, 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 is uh, as a repair, is maximal in terms of size. This one. So this one, the one, is the cardinality repair. So you delete a minimum number of tables. Yeah? So in most applications, people have considered subset repairs. In our case, what will be important are the cardinality repairs. Those that remove a minimum number of tables to restore consistency. Are you okay? So that is the, the difference. So we have two subset repairs, one terminal repair that is one of the This means to be the only one type. Yeah? And these terminal repairs are going to be uh, tightly connected to causality. Yeah? Okay, so I'm going to talk about that, a bit about this uh, repair causality connection. So we have this uh, Boolean conjunctive query, it's a general conjunctive query, right? It's an existential modification of this joint, this long joint. Uh, if, if you notice, if I negate this query, I get a denial constraint. As I said before, it's a negation of conjunctive query, it becomes a denial constraint. Yeah. This is a conjunctive query. This is a conjunctive, this word, conjunctive query. So I put a negation, I can see them as constraints as negation of conjunctive query. You do what I'm doing. Okay, so I will associate to the query for which I want to find causes an integrity constraint, a denial constraint. And we are going to work with this denial constraint from the point of view of repairs, trying to establish connection with causes for the original query over here. Okay, so, and actually the query holds in the database if I don't leave the database is inconsistent with respect to this generated constraint. Yeah? The query is true if I don't leave the database does not satisfy this constraint because the negation is not true because this is true. Yeah, so we are back to the problem of dealing with inconsistent databases with respect to integrity constraints, and then we can play the repair game and say, let's see what we can gain about causality. Yeah. Uh, so S repair are, are associated to causes and minimal contingency sets, minimal contingency sets in terms of set inclusion. And uh, for example, this is a characterization. A database table tau is an actual cause with subset minimal contingency set gamma. Yeah. If and only if this new database, where I remove from the linear database both the gamma and the tuple at hand, is a, an S repair. Yeah. I mean, that is easy to, to establish when you see the connection. I mean, it's not difficult to, to prove that. And the responsibility of the tuple, of this tuple here, is going to be 1 over the 1 plus a cardinality of gamma. It's a, Easy to prove once you once you see the connection, and of course, seal repairs as said before are more important in this context. Are associated to causes, minimum contingency sets that are important for relevance for uh, responsibility, sorry, and maximum responsibility. So this is the, the important part here that I have to read. again. So tau is an actual cost with minimum cardinality, minimum cardinality contingency set gamma. Yeah, if and only if. This one, the same one I have before now, becomes a C repair, a cardinality repair. That means I have removed a minimum number of tuples to restore consistency with respect to, with respect to the generated denial constraints. And it's also a maximum responsibility actual cost. Yeah? Okay, so now we are in a position to exploit I mean, repairs. I mean, uh, and we know actually quite a lot about these C repairs. Uh, uh, so this uh, exploit the connection in algorithms that are complex to resolve for repairs can be used. For example, causality problem, computing, deciding actual causes. This part actually can be done in polynomial time. I mean, if I want to compute the cost, uh, that can be done in polynomial time for this kind of queries that we are considering here. Uh, we, this was part of this was already in the paper by Nelly, who uh, out. Uh, the other part uh, in our paper, 
uh, with Babak Salimi, who was an ACDT paper. Uh, uh, so, for normal, I mean, computing actual process is, is easy. Yeah? Uh, <laughs> however, most computation of problems related to repairs, in particular cardinality repairs, are probably hard in data complexity. We are talking in terms of the complexity in terms of the size of the database, as usual in data margin. Uh, that is a work that we did some time ago with a student of mine, Andre Lopatenko, another ICDT paper actually here in Barcelona, uh, yeah, long ago. And uh, we have a bunch of complexity results in that paper that we, we could exploit in this context. So, for example, just to give the gist, uh, responsibility problem deciding if a table has responsibility about a certain threshold. Uh, above a given number, let's say 0 0.8, yeah, is empty complete for union of one time sequence. Yeah. However, it is not that bad, yeah, but it is six parameter tractable, and in this case the parameter is the inverse of the threshold. So I mean it is bad news, but not too bad news. I mean, uh, if you fix the parameter, I mean things uh, behave relatively well. There are also approximation results that I'm not going to, to mention. Yeah? Uh, computing the responsibility of a tuple is complete for this class. What does it mean? Basically, it is a hard problem. It means it's a functional problem because it's not a decision problem. It's a problem of computing something. It's a functional problem, but, but against the F. Basically, polynomial time, but with a logarithmic number of calls to an NP oracle. So, for example, SAT. Yeah, uh, so it is not cheap. Uh, it is not very cheap. Yeah? Uh, so this has been established. So we are dealing with complex problems. It looks very simple with the mathematical definition, but computing responsibility is not that easy. Deciding if tau, if tau is the most responsible cost, again, is complete for this class. I mean, in data complexity for unit conjecture queries, I mean, you need a polynomial time algorithm with a logarithmic number of close to an NP oracle, like, like SAT, for example. Okay, so, but well, you may wonder well, why you repairs, and well, why did you come up with this idea of connecting causality with repairs? Yeah. Well, basically, I, I wouldn't say nothing particular. Basically, we, we happen to know about the subject. <laughs> And the results were already there, right there. They were like uh, low hanging fruits, I mean, we use them. Uh, nothing but that. I mean, the results for them were available. Uh, and there, uh, uh, and actually, these results were obtained for repairs, but uh, were obtained I mean, with more fundamental methods. I mean, algorithmic and complexity results for graph and hypergraphs uh, that have been investigated much more. Otherwise, we would have. Had to play the same game with process, starting basically from scratch using all kind of graph and hyper graph algorithm and complexity results. And that is uh, so we heavily use results on graph and hyper graph on the, our paper with Popatenko mentioned uh, before, I mean, on cardinality repairs. And repairs uh, can be formulated in hyper graph theoretic terms. Uh, let, let, let me show you the gist of this because you may well where, 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 where do the graphs come from. I mean, right? uh, I think it is useful to, to think about this connection with graph and hypergraphs. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's something, something that will come back later if I have time. So let's go see this inconsistent database. Uh, uh, have these tuples, very simple database, I and mean, just facts of this kind. Yeah. Uh, I have this set of denial constraints, yeah. three denial constraints, yeah, all fine. So obviously there are violations here, uh, for example, uh, A and C, uh, A, R, A, 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 C, A, they make this joint true, so there are violations here. So this is uh, what we call, we introduced long ago, uh, is the con conflict hypergraph. So the tuples are the nodes in the graph, the tuples are the nodes in the graph, and either edges just connect tuples that together violate one of the denial constraints. Yeah. So for example, as I said before, CA uh, 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 
uh, yeah, these two together, I mean, EA and EA, they violate the, the, this constraint and so on. So these two, these th three together, is this and this violate this one, and these two together violate this one. And you have icon edges because there might be more than one than two tuples in the, the edge. Yeah. Okay, so we have conflict effect. And now, basically, the S repairs, the subset repairs, correspond to maximal independent sets in this hypergraph. Maximal independent sets. Yeah? Uh, basically, you want to destroy the connection because destroying the connection means uh, making the constraints true. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? So, uh, and we have in this case, uh, these uh, three repairs, these three repairs that are obtained basically at maximal independent sets. Yeah. Uh, and then two of them, these two are C repairs, these two and these three. And these correspond as well to minimum heating sets for hyper edges. I mean, so all this hypergraph machinery and graph machinery can be used in this context. Uh, 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 and basically, the responsibility of a tuple is the size of a minimum vertex cover that contains it. So you have a tuple that you want a minimum vertex cover, that one that the, minimum, the other tuples that belong to the contingencies. Uh, so these are the connections that are quite useful that we exploited, and I have exploited in other applications I might want to mention later on if I have time. Okay, that is the, the idea. So in the end, we are dealing with uh, hyper graph or graph Okay, let me say a few things about causality and the integrity constraints. I, I will go quickly to this, hopefully. Uh, so far, I haven't considered any kind of constraint here. Uh, well, actually, I don't really have this. We have this kind of, uh, uh, I, don't want, I want to go back to the original problem. Uh, we have a conjunctive query on the database. We don't have constraints. What happens if we have constraints on the database? Yeah. Are going, are, are things going to change? If you think about this, if you have a database that satisfies a query, and there are some constraints on the database that you know, you expect that they are satisfied, would causality change? I mean, it's an intuition, I mean, uh, uh, so again, I repeat, I have a query, I post a query to a database, I get uh, an answer that say yes, it is true. The database also satisfies some constraints. Would you expect something to change in the expect there would be the scenario where I didn't have any constraints in terms of personality? Uh, yeah, constraints remove possible topics from the database. It means the result is smaller. If you have a contract between. Yeah, for example, there could be some a constraint that said, oh, oh, well, I don't know. Foreign key, for example. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's good. Okay. Yeah, you have a, uh, a referential constraint, for example. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Referential constraint will say, if you have this, this has to be there, right? And you saw maybe there is it's something that is not even mentioned in the query, has something to do with the query anyway, right? Yeah, exactly. That is uh, So we, we try to formalize this idea to, to see what happens. Okay, that's good. So it maybe reflects reflects some sort of dependence or independence among data we start with depending on the constraint that you have. Yeah, the, when they are satisfied, of course, and we are starting from the assumption that they are satisfied. So they should have an impact on causality. Uh, so we need a definition that involves those constraints. Uh, so for example, the counterfactual sub-instances that are obtained by deletions of tuples. I mean, they should satisfy them as well. I mean, so that is a basic imposition that we are going to, to make. So we are start assuming that the database satisfies a set of constraints, yeah. any kind of constraints for the moment. Uh, uh, and now for tau, the table to be an actual cost for this query. In this case, it's an internship query, so it's a Boolean query anyway. You just put values inside, doesn't matter. The continuous set gamma must satisfy what? The consistency of this set must satisfy some additional conditions because now we have constraints. So basically, we have that uh, 
if I delete, I mean, the gamma I still should be the, the, the data is satisfied, uh, the, the constraint satisfied, otherwise we are not taking them into account. And when I delete gamma, I still make it 22 because it is a continuous set only. I need to remove the tabla and to invalidate the query. So when I remove I, I, the, the additional tabla I have at hand now, then I still satisfy the constraint. However, the query is no longer true. That is what I had before. Yeah, that was our take on constraints. And now the question was, does anything change or not? Uh, uh, and responsibility is defined as before. Oh, okay. Okay, let me give you an example. We're going to go very quickly through, through this uh, uh, because uh, I think, uh, I hope you get more or less the gist of what's going to come. So, the query here is, uh, Give me, uh, here I have an open query, but again, as I said, it's not a big deal. I can instantiate everything with John and we have a Boolean query. So John is, a, is an answer to the query in the database. It's a, it's a, it's a join here, as before. Tau1 is a counterfactual cause. If I remove this, basically, I'm not going to be able to, to make the query true. Uh, uh, T4, if I remove T4, that also contains the John, but John is also here, not this, uh, uh, it's also a, a, a cause, but it has a single minimal continuous set gamma 1, that is this one over here, right? This one has this continuous set, I need to remove the two of them, basically. Yeah? Uh, and T8, again, is the same thing, I mean, if I remove this one, I need to remove the other one. So they are have the responsibility one half without considering any constraints so far. What happens if I have, can you guess that correctly, a referential constraint, right? Uh, every time I have something in the department uh, table, I must have at least an X should appear somewhere. somewhere. This Y and X should appear here, assigned with some uh, uh, force code for here. No sabbaticals. Huh? No sabbaticals. But bankers are not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not allowed here. Yeah, that's, that's right. If, if you are a member of the department, you must teach. Uh, okay, so we have a constraint now. Now, maybe connected things that do not appear even in the query. Right? So that is the point. So, in this case, what happened is, uh, I'm not going to go through really through the details, I hope you can reconstruct this later on. So now we lose T4 and T8 as uh, they are not actual causes anymore. Yeah. So we, we lose causes yeah, in this case. Uh, because, well, why? Because you must have something here that otherwise you them is not going to be satisfied. Uh, so this is the one thing. T1 is still a counterfactual cost. This one over here is still satisfied uh, because the obligation here is to have something here on this table, right? The right hand side of the referential constraint. Uh, 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 so actually, under the integrity constraint, uh, 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 here you have another query. Uh, if, if I remove T1, why, why is it constraint? It says that for everything that uh, appears on the department table, there should be a course in the course table. But if there is something in the course table, it doesn't mean that there has to be someone in the department table. No? Nobody has no actual. I mean, if you remove T1, there's nothing violated from... No, yeah, but, but, yeah, nothing violated. It doesn't violate the constraint. The, the constraint is typically true. If you remove T1, the constraint is not violated. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have, want to destroy the flow. I, I, I have a question, but I will ask it after. I, I, I mean, if, if, if this becomes false, the whole thing becomes true. And I mean, in T1, the other part was everything of the same part because everything. Nothing like it is 
If I remove T1, yes. this query will not be true and it will not violate the constraint. Because if I delete this, this is going to be false. This is going to be a true constraint because it's not false or something. But you cannot delete them because if you delete them, you are not going to satisfy the the, the constraint anymore. Okay, but we are No, 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 no. They, they have never been actually with counterfactual. Uh, the two of them are actual causes and not counterfactual. Because they need additional additional additions. I don't know. Sorry, I don't know. The factual cost means basically deleting that couple, single couple is good enough to, to invalidate the curve. Okay. T4 and T8 are not on the factual because if you remove only one of them, you need to remove the other. Yeah. So if you re end up removing the two of them, the constraint will be false. Because you need something on the right hand side. If you delete something on the left hand side, that is the only thing the candidate is the one, this one saying this invalidates the query, and this is still true because you are making false the antecedent of an implication. I cannot delete T4 or T8 alone. I need to delete the other one as well as a part of the message. If I remove the two of them, this constraint will not be true anymore because the left, the right hand side will not be true. Being the left hand side true because T1 is still there. Right? So, uh, and when I remove only T1, again, this constraint is still true because the antecedent is false. Okay. And this is the constraint is an implication that for false implies anything that is true. Uh, okay, uh, here I have another query. So I have with this query, I have this one here. What happens here? I have a query that is something like a residue, residue or, or a fragment of this query. Yeah? Only a part of it. However, if you put this together with this, basically this query is equivalent to this one. Because this, whenever this happens, this happens. So basically having this is good enough to have this as well. So basically under the constraint, the two queries are the same. Equivalent, logically equivalent under the constraint. Well, you can prove that under the constraint, basically you obtain the same process. They are designed under logical equivalence of the constraint, which is something that is nice and nice. <laughs> okay. Uh, and now we have this other query that is now at the right, the right hand side only, not the left hand side. Now you cannot use this uh, equivalence anymore because the, the implication goes in that direction or in this direction. So you have, we have an essentially different query. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, okay, I think I, I, I need to move on. I, I will leave this, but I want to show something. Uh, I will leave this as an exercise. Uh, now, what is important to show here at the end is that you have the same process as before, but the responsibilities change. So, <laughs> this is the important thing to do. The, the responsibilities, so under constraints, the responsibilities may change. Even if we have the same process, the responsibilities change because there is now there is a constraint involved that. Uh, may give more support than to some topics. Yeah? Uh, 
so the responsibility is then to decrease because there is an, 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 an implication that this also gives a support to, to them. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, so, T1, uh, in this case, for this query, you know, this is a nice thing about this. This query that is not talking about, uh, about this table. You know, at least the topic you want here. And what else? This query is about the second part of the right hand side of the constraint. So, P, P, P1 is not an actual cost for this query. It's not an actual cost for this query in the old sense. Yeah, because actually it's not even involved in this table. However, the, it affects the responsibility of the actual process for this query because the, it is involved in the, in the integrity constraint, on the left hand side of the integrity constraint. So it has an impact then on the total result. I hope you get the, the feeling. I mean, uh, okay. Uh, uh, what is interesting to, to this slide? Uh, 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 let me mention this. Okay. Uh, <coughs> actually, uh, there is, in this case, you have constraints, the complexity may grow. Yeah? Before computing, computing process was basically for no time. Yeah? Uh, deciding, the deciding, I mean, uh, Causality was basically for normal time, but now if you have an inclusion dependency, for example, the, the problem now becomes intrinsically more complex, it becomes anti complete in data. So this really complicates the, the, the algorithmic aspects of this uh, causality computation. Yeah. Uh, so, also something that we investigated was what happens with the causality beyond junior penalty queries. For example, data log queries, data log queries, so you have, they have recursion. Yeah. And actually, for data log queries, cost computation that was for a longer time before now can become NP complete. Probably NP complete. Yeah. Yeah. That was, as I said, for a longer time for junior penalty queries. The data of ways, and actually, you have to use recursion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you have a self join in the conjecture query, it is still calling normal time, or is it the, if I have a self join inside, yeah. it is still calling normal time? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah I, I know what you're asking because usually the self join is stronger, it's stronger. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, in this case, of course, I mean, it, it, it is fine. Uh, can, I, can I ask a general question? Or, or if we have time, I will ask it again. Just not to destroy the flow. Uh, I ask it if you want to discuss it later. Okay. I don't, I, I'm not so sure why everything is symmetrical. I mean, you have gamma and tau. Okay. And basically, the idea is that for every candidate tau, you will compute the gamma. Um, and see which one is the minimum. Okay, pretty much. But the naive, let's say, approach. Probably there are more clever ways, but the tau comes from anywhere, if I understand correctly. It can come from any relation of yeah, it can be any couple of data. What what happens if I want only from one table? So I have the, the same stable with four engines. Oh, no, that, that is, yeah, I mean, yeah, that, I haven't mentioned that, but actually you can do that. I mean, actually we have done, actually you can partition the database into what we call endogenous couples and exogenous couples. Okay. And then you look at, uh, for process. I think I understand. <laughs> <laughs> and then basically you want to find process of that endogenous couples. And basically these are the, the tuples that you are, the endogenous one, those that you are questioning, you want to find something more about them. And the exogenous one are, are those that you don't have any control of one, and they come from other sources, you don't want to, you accept them as they are, and basically you can focus the, the, the analysis on endogenous classes. And in some cases, that partition has really important consequences, for example, as I will show later today. Uh, when they go to Chapri values and database, I mean, if that partition is crucial, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, you, you are perfectly right. 
and also there is view based causality, you want to find causal to belong to a view. I mean, all this has been generalized, but I don't really want to do it. But that's a good question, yeah. By the way, those, those things are in, can be found in the reference at the end. I've seen your page in your talks. <laughs> I went to your page, you have all the talks. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. No secrets here. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, in order to get the result, we made a connection with the analog abduction. I mean, you see, this connection with the uh, diagnosis in KI is quite useful as well. But uh, okay. Then we move into something different before going to the. Have half an hour? Okay, okay, I have one. Okay. Uh, I still causality, but from a different angle. Okay. Okay. Causal responsibility can be seen as an explanation as for for data with status in relation to where results. Uh, I think that that is uh, the main that we take on. Okay. It's not the only possible score. And here I'm going to explore a different one that comes, as I said before, from causality in more general terms and mainly from an area of causality that is uh, called observational causality for observational studies. I mean, studies where you have data and you are not in position to divide things nationally into control groups. I mean, testing here, you cannot so easily play the counterfactual game. So I'm going to take these people and I'm going to administer some medication and see what happens with those guys, right? In many situations, you are not kind of afford doing that. I mean, yeah, so you cannot have naturally uh, at the same time control groups, and you have to somehow find those control groups from the data. You know? Those are observational and suddenly causality has a lot uh, to contribute in that direction. It has contributed actually. By the way. I should mention that uh, I think two years ago, the Nobel Prize in Economics was given to uh, two guys, I mean, uh, who apply causality in, uh, in, in, in economics, in applications of economics. Uh, it's like in, uh, Widow Imbens and Angris, I mean, the, the two guys, they have worked on causality in observational studies in the context of economics, for something you cannot create control groups. But they got the Nobel Prize in economics. So this is a very solid established area of causality. Okay, so this notion of causal effect, I mean, it has it, its origin in that context, and um, it's due to Donald Rubin, that is the father of causality in observational studies. Yeah? Uh, okay, uh, so we, we try to use this in the context of data. Uh, as you will see, it's not exactly what they do, but it's heavily inspired by what they do. Okay, so uh, it is not the only possible scores, and then let me show this example here. Here we have uh, this is our database, basically these connections in the graph. If you can forget the table and look at this. So you have connection between tuples, right? So this is tuple P2, a connection between A and C, not? A and B. Uh, and so these are the tuples that you find here. Yeah, concentrate on the graph. You don't need to look at the data. So basically, here I stated the query as a kind of a data log query, but actually it could be easily stated as a union of connected queries. I mean, it's not that you know, so data log, but it's not data log notation is not crucial here at all. So what you want to do is to the query is: is there a path between A and B? And of course, there are paths. That is, you have a direct path here, there is an indirect path here, and there is an even more indirect path, path over here. Okay. Okay. So the query is true. In this case, it will answer yes. Okay. <coughs> okay. Can you tell me what is the responsibility of the tables? The slides. <laughs> <laughs> you already have the slides? I'm cheating. I got the data slides. <laughs> 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 That's the <not okay. laughs> I mean, you might expect that the, the first connection, the direct connection, is a, a stronger cost, maybe. But actually, 
it's not the case. Actually, all the tuples basically have the same responsibility because you need to remove other things to invalidate the connection between A and B. Uh, so the query is true. The, uh, the query, yeah, you get yes, it's true. Uh, but can be expressed as a union of connected query. So all tuples are actual process. Yeah. Uh, every tuple is in a, appears in a path from A to B. Yeah. And all tuples have the same responsibility one third. And that may be a bit counterintuitive. Yeah. At least that it was. Uh, I think this is uh, some uh, analysis that was our uh, thought at that point. Okay, so the question is can we maybe come up with a different score that maybe is more suitable for this example or other example, other situation as well? Uh, I think a precise uh, analysis of the connections and differences between causal effect and responsibility is something that is still uh, to be done. Uh, so maybe this is counterintuitive. T1 provides a direct path from A to B. Again, but still, it's as responsible as the other topics in the data. So we propose using an alternative to causal responsibility, a causal effect score. That is, uh, there was a paper with uh, my PhD student, Babak Salimi, who is now a professor at the University of California, San Diego, with Dan Sushu, with uh, Kifan and Brook. Uh, and, uh, and I think there are many things to do in this direction. Uh, so, as I said, the origin is in observational studies. I mean, so, uh, uh, okay, so uh, basically, we are going to again uh, play the counterfactual game. Yeah. Usually, in causality in general, you play the counterfactual game on some sort of causal model, a causal model that, is, that usually takes its form. Of a, a structural causal, causal model, something like a network. Think of a major network, something like that. Yeah, that is what you are going to find when you read the books that you have heard of. You know? yeah. So they are. You, you find you perform counterfactual interventions by changing values in a model. That is basically something like a network. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so in our case, what is our structural causal model? What model? In our case, we model was provided by the lineage of the query. Today, in the presentation by Katja Hosse, she mentioned, I mean, provenance, we are talking about the same, yeah? Uh, so, the lineage of the query, okay? So here we have, I'm going to show you in the light of this example. We have a database, we have a volume and the query, uh, uh, very simple one. Uh, if it's true in the database, because you can make the join true, and the lineage of the query, basically, internship from D is given by a propositional formula. Yeah? So the lineage is basically, again, a propositional formula that contains, basically, one propositional variable, one atomic formula for each of the tables in the database. Yeah? So, in this case, you have a join, so you are expected to find this contention here. Yeah? This, in order for the query to be true, this has to be true, or this has to be true, or this has to be true. Of course, if you don't have the database of hand, I mean, this could be a much more general expression, but if you instantiate this uh, lineage on the query, then you prove, prove many other things that do not appear in the database, and basically you end up having this, uh, this propositional formula, I repeat, it's a propositional formula uh, that captures uh, the way that we can make the query true in this particular data. So x tau is a propositional variable that is true if and only if the tuple is in the data. Yeah. Okay. And of course you can play, start playing the counterfactual game of, for example, deleting this tuple or making this propositional variable true or false, etc. Uh, so we want to quantify the contribution of a tuple to a query answer, but we are not going to play the responsibility game. We are going to play a different game, the causal effect game. So we are going to assign probabilities, probabilities to the tuples in the database. Yeah? 
So this database is not going to, not going to be a usual relational database, it's going to be a probabilistic database in the sense of, I mean, I don't know, Suchi or Piano, you may have seen this famous monograph in the quality database. Exactly that. Yeah. Uh, so we assign uniform and independent probability to tuples in the database. Uh, so, for example, one half, which is these are independent. So this tuple is independent from this one, this is independent from this one, and each of them. What is the meaning? Did AB is in the database with probability one half or not? Yeah. Basically, that is what the probability represents in the probability database. The probability of the tuple being present in the database. Yeah. In this case, it may be or may not be, and the probability of being, being in the database is one half. Yeah. But it's rational because we don't have any other assumptions to. Uh, 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 it would be interesting to explore this in the context of the constraints. Probably change because there are some dependencies. Okay. Okay, but that's not what I'm going to do. Probabilistic. So we have a probabilistic database in, in the proper sense of the term. Uh, and every tuple that is outside there is has by definition probably be zero. So uh, these are now we have now we have random variables, right? They're now independent, identical in situ to then the random variables to take a value of true or false. Yeah, they are independent from each other, and they have this uniform distribution. Of course, the query then becomes also a random variable, because it depends on random variables. Yeah. So we have a, a random query. This is because causal effect needs are assumed a probability distribution. We, we are coming up, coming up with a natural probability distribution. Yeah. So what is the probability that the Q takes a particular truth value when an intervention is performed on this? So you can start performing intervention, like for example, deleting part of the database. So the probability of the query being true may change. So that is a big measure again. So the interventions using the uh, Carroll's notation are going to be 2x equal x. That means make this variable random variable x take the value x, true or false in this case, because they are randomly random variable. Yeah? Uh, so this is basically what we are going to perform on the sexual mode equation that make x take value. In the sexual equation, that is the genius, make x take the value x. So for example, we have things like this. If x and y and x belong to 0, 1, I mean true or false, basically we are going to ask, what is the probability of being True, for example, the one is one when we make this tuple false, or we make this variable take the value zero. We have those combinations. You make uh, some of the tuples true or false, and then the query has a probability of being true or false, and that is a probability that you would compute using the probabilistic database that we have created. Uh, Okay, uh, so for example, if I do x sp equal to zero and I'm making one of these false, my lineage changes. Now I have a, a, a shorter lineage. I have only one of the conjuncts. I had three conjuncts before, now I have only one of them. Because I, it was this one, so I'm making one of these, this false, this false left, it should be left with this. Yeah. Okay, so this is what I have now. This is the lineage when I perform the, of the factual intervention of making this variable false. Yeah. So what is the causal effect of tau? Yeah. Uh, and in this case, this is basically going to be this one, yeah? XSP. Yeah. Basically, I'm deleting SP from database and making it false. So the causal effect on this the, the, the definition uh, is the expected difference between the outcomes. So the causal effect of this tuple tau is the expected value of the query, because the query can be true or false, uh, when I make the when the, the tuple is in the database basically, when they get true, and the set of the expected value of the query when the is not in the database anymore and making it false. 
is the difference in expected value or the expected difference between having the tuple and not having the tuple in the database. Are we? So this is the definition of causal effect in this particular situation, but this, this is quite general. And of course, you can have a, a statistical data, and you can play the same game, you, you, you do estimation, but in the end, it's an expected difference. When you compute the cause and effect, it's an expected difference. Yeah. Why, why do we use the do equation? No, I mean, it's just a, I, I, we do, do this because just we, we want you to use an equation that you don't want to use this everywhere. I mean, that is not. Uh, yeah, because uh, Perry makes this, uh, at least what I read from Perry, the idea was that okay, we don't have counterfactuals here. We simulate it with, with do. Uh, if you don't mix do with uh, uh, hypothetical words, let's say. The idea of, of, of fair, fair makes a, a big case in one of the books, at least the one I read. But if, if you have hypothetical words, uh, you, you don't use to, if I understand correctly, we are deep in hypothetical worlds if we start saying that they have a probability of whether they exist or not. But to the extent that this is not to their parents too, but just a, a, an idea of setting the, the, the probability of something. Right. If I understand correctly, the, the idea of two is just playing the probabilities, right? No, 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 no. In, no. in, in, in Europe, you have a, something like a Bayesian network. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then you one of the values in the network is fixed. set, is fixed. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so you keep the flows from exactly. Yeah, yeah. But 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 <clears throat> since he says that when we go to hypothetical, I mean when you say do. It means that in the real world, I fixed it. I mean, I have an experiment where I, I measure the ice cream sales for summer. I have an experiment where I measure ice cream sales for the entire year. If I say do season in summer, this is a different experiment rather than saying take over the year and I select only the, 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 the tuples that belong to the summer. These are two different experiments. Because, for example, if you compute the zeta score of the sales, they are different. So, so basically, the, the idea is that the do means uh, something in the real world. And I can, I can relate. I mean, you have a probability code, which means that if I turn something zero in the probability, it means I practically delete the tuple. Um, well, I am deleting the tuple. That is the counterfactual. Game, I know the changing the probability. You're, 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 you're not playing the, the, the probabilities in, in, in the do. No. You're, you're deleting tuples. Yeah. I'm making it false. And the do x score equals 1 makes it true. Right. Yeah. Then why, why do you need the probabilities? Uh, Well, just to make a comparison between the, the, the computer can expect the value, because even if I delete, if I keep the tuple, the query would be true or false, I mean, because there is a probability involved. But I'm not changing the probability. Okay. 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 Uh, okay, now everything is basically boils down to computing these expected values, and you can imagine this is something that is not too difficult. To do, I mean, uh, um, well, uh, uh, I think uh, basically, uh, I mean, I'm not doing anything exotic here. I mean, uh, uh, <coughs> so I have the different cases. Probably that is probably that way is true, given that I deleted the tuples. But then basically, I, I, what I'm doing is basically analyzing this uh, residual, I mean, uh, finish that I had before. And I have to compute the probability of these two. These, these two tuples are independent. They have one half and one half, one half is one fourth. So, and so on. So it's very simple to compute these probabilities by using the independence assumption. 
as I said, it will be interesting to explore this in the context of constraints because there may be some dependence there that cannot be avoided. But in this case, it works fine. Okay, uh, when you make ex ex when this is true, I mean now you are have internship of the miniature of this kind. And basically, well, you compute again the, the probability. I'm not going to, to go through the computation, but it's just a computation of expected values. You need to have the two situations. I mean, uh, when the query is true or false, uh, under the given assumptions of this kind, conditionals, and then basically what we get is this difference between uh, expected values and this is the, the causal effect of. Uh, uh, this particular tuple that we were analyzing. Uh, and now, I mean, uh, you, you can check the details, really, it's not it's very difficult to compute. But now, if we apply this, it was much easier to apply. Well, I don't know if, if it was much easier to apply the causal effect notion to this or to the uh, original example, doesn't matter. I mean, maybe this is more clear. But if you go back to the example that motivated this uh, problem of introducing a new causal effect, actually, you now you see that there is a difference. I mean, this tuple here that was connected A and B directly has a causal effect much larger than the other ones. Whereas the tuples that were here in this very indirect uh, uh, trajectory or path, they have much smaller responsibility than the other ones. I would say it's a nice way to, to take into account the length of the path that you just connect to. Yeah, basically you end up multiplying from it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so this gives a, a more intuitive result. I think, I mean, uh, there is a lot to do in terms of exploiting this notion of causal effect in this context of data management and also in machine learning. I, mean, uh, I think uh, it's something that deserves investigation. Uh, uh, no, but I wanted you to, 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 to see that there are alternatives, that there are other scores. Uh, so there are not many things to, that have to be done in terms of research, connecting uh, different scores, see what properties they have, they share, according to which properties they differ. I mean, there is a lot to do in this, in this area, many open problems. I was wondering whether there, there could be a way to not have the same probabilities for T45 and T6, knowing that, for instance, I don't know, um, there are two edges that actually connect directly A and B, because A is the starting point and B is the uh, uh, last point of the path, I would say. Why? There's one in the middle that connects the two, uh, and I was wondering whether there could be an option to say, well, this one is probably as, a, as an author, a different role than the, the first two. I don't know if that makes sense. But I mean, if you take a look at it, but this is where we started from. I mean, uh, uh, we started from this table. So, is there any reason to, to really assign different probabilities to this a priori? I mean, uh, um, Maybe because there are the, the But you want to make it very dependent on the, uh, yeah, for something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's true. Uh, yeah, but prima facie I don't see any reason to, to proceed that, that way. Uh, 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 okay, uh, I think uh, uh, actually it's a good point when we just stop here and see. Uh, okay, so the causal effects are different for different tuples. Maybe we obtain more intuitive results than with responsibility. Uh, it has been applied also to aggregate queries, and actually I'm working quite a lot on this on the causal effect in order to uh, of the compute causality in the context of multidimensional databases. Where there is also an extra element that is very interesting here is the notion of abstraction. Yeah? Because in multidimensional data, when you think of data warehouses, we have different levels of abstraction. So, can you compute causes of responsibility, plus the effect of certain level? I mean, at different levels and establish correct correspondences between them. 
So that is something I'm doing now in this moment with the PhD student of mine. Uh, I think there are interesting things to do in, the, in, the, in terms of using uh, fossil effect, in particular in the context of aggregate queries and multidimensional databases. Uh, um, uh, possible effect can also be obtained by, by a coalition game theory, and it's something I'm going to illustrate this afternoon. You can regain causal effect as is, as is called uh, the Pantsaf index of game theory, which is very interesting. With the connection that we didn't expect at all to, to find. Let's just start exploring the use of game theory to provide explanation in data management and also in machine learning. But that is something that we're going to explore. And that is exactly what I'm going to do later. <laughs> I, I think it's a good point just to stop. Okay. 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 If there are questions, or complaints, attacks, whatever. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm trying to understand the deeper intuition of the process. This is how random can be. Uh, what does it matter that the uh, uh, is true uh, with a different dice for every different couple that participates in the unit? This is something that ties behind the, the, the intuition of the program. I mean, I understand the, the length of the path, okay, but this is just because this was a, a relation with the edges of the graph. If it was something else, it wouldn't be the length of the path. Well, I mean, in the context of observational style, what you are going to cover basically, you are trying to identify different control groups by, let's say, matching methods. I mean, they are not designed a priori, but statistically speaking, you can say this uh, group is separate from this one, right? And basically, these are the two cases that you can. Estimate the average, maybe not the expected value. I mean, what the two different groups and see how the average differ. And if you detect the difference, that you detect that, that the treatment or whatever you are investigating has an effect. Yeah. That is, uh, I think, an intuition. Okay. Yeah. So we are just borrowing that idea, make it maybe a bit more formal in the prolific sense and, and using it in this context. But that is the uh, the idea of the causal effect as used in observational studies. So basically, the two conditions are the two say, groups that you statistically manage to identify because you couldn't decide that map. Right? Then you compute the average and compare, compare the average. But I think it's a better way to. Is there is a like consistency between the response and the score and the product the score, right? That, um, or I mean, by consistency, I mean uh, the fact that causal effect score is maybe more, I mean, it's finer than the response and the score. Is, is there something like that? Or can you say well, no, as I said before, I mean, I haven't seen any research on the analysis or the comparison. Of different scores, and I, I think that is long overdue. And I'm trying to do something that is a lot of new. If you have chosen made the responsibility score, you can do the assumption, the decreasing assumption. Is there are any models that you can use uh, function decreasing assumption to use to make based on the size of uh, the continuity set? If it's a one over one plus the uh, the continuity of the continuity set. Uh, use any other fraction, you put one over one plus, it's always one and then 0 0.5, so you have a big decrease for between the first and the second responsible uh, result. Is it a problem because your, your book was sometimes around the score, the importance of the score, and then this is very constrained then by this formula of responsibility. So can you change the formula to express other responsibilities that could be more gradual or this Behaviors. I, think, I guess that I get that the rank of the, the most responsible is still the one is one and the second one is that the second one is zero point five, the third one is mm -hmm. one over four. It's, 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 uh, 
I don't know if it's a problem or uh, maybe it doesn't change the, the ranking to change the function, but then you can get scores that are more relevant in a sense. Okay. I have seen other, other scores as well, so I've heard this, but uh, uh, if you can see I've done uh, all the many essential difference. I mean, they, 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 they are basically a, a line, the rankings are a line. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. The ranking is the same. Yeah, but sometimes yeah. the score is important. Yeah. Yeah. The decision that you want to aggregate with something else yeah. 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 on yeah. some machine learning, that's, that's why I know that the ranking should not change. Ideally, yeah. otherwise. Yeah. Well, actually, I, I would have to compare. I'm not sure about the comparison, for example, of this causality, uh, causal responsibility, and the uh, chart scores. Uh, I think that this subject has to be investigated because, uh, well, I, I, I will mention it in a second, but I think that Thanks, well, we are talking in the back of the head. Okay, I think we can yeah. start. Thank, thank yeah. you for the first part. <laughs> no, everyone asking me, people came in at the, at the uh, as I was going inside, and they asked, Why are you going to the steering committee? I don't know, maybe someone said my name. I don't know. I have no idea what it means. Yes, I was really angry. Yeah. <laughs> we need to put the data. <laughs> what is what need I Because Patrick told me to launch the tutorial, but then we can wait. Uh, we I have wait. already told them that we start in three minutes. Okay, so three minutes ago. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> okay. I think uh, we, we should. If it's okay, uh, for the distant connection. Okay. Well, thank you for surviving. Uh, oh, that's super interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to we're going to play a different game uh, now, literally. I mean, uh, we're going to talk about position values and chicory value, which is relevant in data management and also relevant in financial machine learning. Uh, so our, our initial motivation, I mean, I'm talking about when we started thinking about these ideas with uh, Ben Fieberfeld, Esther Lipschitz, and uh, basically with them, was I mean, to, to somehow measure the contribution of the uh, database coupled to the inconsistency of a database. And uh, as I tried to convince you this morning, I mean, there is, that is not very different from uh, uh, identifying, I mean, the contribution of a tuple to, to a query result. I mean. uh, so uh, that is what we started doing in the end. I mean, uh, and, and we uh, address the problem of measuring the contribution of tuples uh, to uh, uh, the result of a query. We, we are going to still keep uh, talking about the uh, Boolean queries, the negative queries. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so the important observation now is, of course, I mean, as you saw this, uh, this morning, is that usually you need several couples I mean, together to produce a query result or to, or to violate an integrity constraint. So this is very much in, uh, similar to the situation that we have in uh, coalition game uh, theory. Uh, so they, all of them contribute to something like a shared game or wealth function in different ways. And we want to capture the contribu individual contribution of the players. In this case, the players are going to be, in this context of data management, the data stuff. So, uh, from that point of view, it was very natural to consider an established measure that is using game theory that is the shapely value of a player. Yeah? As a measure of its contribution to a shared wealth function. 
I miss sorry, I miss the most of the presentation this morning. I had to to leave for for some time, so maybe uh, you, you already explained. But uh, this morning, what I saw you were talking about queries, right? And you are not talking about integrity constraints. No, no, I mean, I just, I, what I just said is we started thinking about the integrity constraints uh, in terms of violation of constraints, what is the contribution. But uh, in the morning, I kind of made a case that basically the, it's very similar. The, the it, it's, this is my point, that actually yeah, it's yeah, just so, uh, the same, right? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, yeah. Just negate one and you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the point is not this distinction. No, no, no. Okay, no, it's not so. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so in this case, the data will start to become the players. Yeah, and of course, in order to apply the Shelby value, we need a gain function. And the gain function is always application dependent. There is nothing like a one single gain function that is applied to everything. In every setting, you have to come up with the right gain function. And then the rest is given by whatever Shelby proposed. As in okay. So this is the general setting now. Uh, a set of players is D. In this case, I'm using D because we are thinking of database tuples. So that is what is this the set of players. We have a game function uh, that sends subsets of the database of the set of tuples to real numbers. I mean, it takes a set of players, subset of the players, and sends that sub team to the real number. Yeah? That is a game function, as I said before. We have to choose the game function that, that comes later. Uh, so the shape value given the game function G is defined always like this. It's just given by shape. And that's so with this formulation, he obtained the Nobel Prize in economics and many things. I mean, so, uh, so we just have to use this. What is this saying? Basically, you have one single player, you want to measure the contribution of the player to this wealth of game function. That appears here. Yeah. Uh, and what is this saying is well, we have to take all, all the difference between the sub instances of uh, sub teams of players. Uh, in one case, we add the player at hand P, and in the other case, we keep it outside. So all the S's here are sub, -int sub instances of P that do not contain P. Here we add P to the sub in this case, we keep it outside. And we have to see what is different uh, between the game function in terms of having P and not having P. And we have to consider all the possible subsets of the database that do not contain P, so from the empty set up to the full P minus P. And we also here in this case consider the order in which the players participate. So this uh, numerator here is the number of permutations of D with all the players in S coming first, this part. Then comes P and then come the rest. And also you can see all the possible permutations. Yeah? It may look a bit strange. Uh, of course, here we have all the, the set of all the, the number of permutations. Yeah? So, uh, so it's basically, it's an average. It's an average. Of this difference between having P and not having P for all the possible subfields in the computer average. Uh, yeah, uh, so basically, this is the expected contribution on average, an expectation of player P and the all possible additions of P to a partial random sequence of players, this point, uh, followed by a random sequence of the rest of the players. So here, this is showing what is going on. For example, I had all these. Uh, the elements in the S, this, this S here, and then I add P, the one over here, and this makes the produce a difference of plus four. So this would be four, this difference would be four here. Okay. So this may look a bit strange, but actually shapely show that there is only one measure that satisfies certain given properties that, that we listed as desired. And this is basically the actualization that he gave is categorical. I mean, there is only one function, this one over here, that does the job. Yeah? Which is very interesting. It is not interesting mathematical work. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much into details, but I mean, this would, may look a bit arbitrary. And later on, we're going to see what happens when we ignore the order. Yeah. Yeah, but this is checking. I haven't changed anything. So the database tuples 
Later, we are going to use teacher values as players in the context of machine learning. Yeah, for the moment, we are so will be the players in the game. Yeah, we fine. Uh, okay, so this is a very well established measure of contribution of players to a well function. It emerges as the only measure enjoying certain properties. For each application, one defines an appropriate game function. That is very important because what I presented before is here on. Another important thing to, to mention is that Shapely is probably hard to compute. I mean, uh, sharply hard. Or, uh, yeah. So, for example, obviously the naive approach of considering all the possible subsets and of the data will be it's going to be exponential anyway. So even if you try something more clever, it's going to be, in some cases, probably sharply complete, I mean, uh, sharply hard, I mean, probably difficult. Uh, so actually, sharply uh, computation is sharply hard in general. Uh, uh, so that is uh, the complex, for those who are not familiar, I don't know, maybe you're all familiar, I don't know. The complex, this is a complexity class uh, of possibly implicitly compu implicit computational counting problems. So it is associated to counting, for example, the number of valuations that satisfy a, a propositional formula, or things like that. Yeah? The number of uh, colorings of the graph, or the three colors, and etc. So it's, it, it, that, that's what you want. So being sharply hard is an evidence, evidence of difficulty. For example, this problem, is sharply hard. What is this? Counting the number of evaluation assignments that make the propositional formula true. We know that that has to be hard because uh, it is at least as difficult as that. Because if I get, I have the the, the, the counting valuation that make the formula true, I get zero. I know it's not possible. If I get three, I know it is. So it is at least as hard as solving that. Yeah. So that is a. Uh, the typical uh, sharp e hard problem is sharp sub, the number of evaluations. Okay, so we are dealing with an intrinsically difficult problem, and maybe this will be very important for what comes later. Okay, now we are going to apply the shape value as a scores in databases. So the database samples are the, where the players in the coalition game. I'm going to use this query to illustrate things. Uh, a very special kind of query, actually very similar to the one I used in the morning. Uh, uh, so it takes a value of zero or one in the database. So what is would be a good uh, the game function in this case? Well, in this case, uh, basically, uh, the game function becomes the Boolean value of the query, that is one or zero, basically. Uh, a, a, and the numerical value of the query, if it is an aggregate query, in the paper with uh, uh, Ben Eberton and Stalipsis, we investigated the two situations. I mean, basically conjunctive queries, like the one over here, and aggregations on top of, on top of conjunctive queries. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we didn't go beyond that. I think Benny and Stan, they continue working with some negations here. But I haven't done that myself. Uh, so the contribution of tuple tau to query result is going to be given by Shapley. And not the only thing I'm doing is I'm putting here a particular game function that is the query. So what is the query the value of the query when I have this subintas plus tau and we have the instance subintas without tau? It will be basically zero or, 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 or one basically. Since it is a monotone query, basically it's always going to be one or zero. Never minus one. This is monotone. But, okay. Yeah. Everything? So, now the question is uh, how hard is it computing this thing? Yeah. So, we have to consider all possible permutation of some instances of B, uh, and then the average of differences between having T or not, as you tau or not, that's what we're doing. So, we investigate in that paper algorithmic complexity and approximation problem. Yeah. Uh, that is a paper that we, yeah, uh, was an ICDT paper. That is also a journal version already. Yeah. Uh, what I mentioned this morning is very important in our setting, actually, to have this distinction between endogenous tuples and exogenous tuples. 
actually the result of the obtain, uh, our obtain, making use of this assumption that we have, that the data is able to separate them in between endogenous and exogenous. Uh, so we want to measure the contribution of endogenous tuples. Those are those that are subject to investigation, to analysis, or whatever. The others are given, and they come from a different source. We don't question them, but we inherited them, but we don't care about them. Yeah? Okay, so the exogenous are not subject to any contrafactual intervention, basically. They stay, in our case, in all the sub-instances, in all the S's that I consider, they, they stay there. They, okay, I throw you back. Uh, so they could be those in a particular table or particular source. So the, we are going to consider now something you asked us this morning, yeah. consider the William Penjack equation without self joint. Actually, self joints, as you probably know, they, they kill everything I mean, in many situations. I mean, so we are very basically in the same situation. We are not, we are going to assume so that we don't have anything that it is. Self joint means the same predicate appears in the more than once in the, in the query. Yeah. So you have a join with R and R. Yeah. Okay. So we have obtained a dichotomy result, a dichotomy theorem, that is actually they're not in general not easy to obtain. So it is a, it is a good thing I mean, to obtain a dichotomy theorem. But basically, sharply differentiate two different two situations, right? But there is nothing in between that we don't know about. So, for queries without a join, we can produce this dichotomy theorem. So, we have a fixed query, a fixed query, a query space. We want to complete the Sheffield value, okay, for the different tuples that the query space. So, if the query is hierarchical, hierarchical, I'm going to say what it is, just to get the gist of what they're trying to convey. If the query is hierarchical, then for every database, for every database, the Sheffield values can be computed in polynomial time. If the query is fixed and it is hierarchical, the Sheffield values for all the tuples, endogenous tuples, can be computed in polynomial time. If the query is not hierarchical, to the other way, the fastest way is the dichotomy result, the other case. Uh, the problem is, it's a computational problem because it's going to be a function, a functional problem because we're computing something, not decided on it. It's P sharp P complete. That means polynomial time with calls to an oracle that is in sharp P. I mean, that is bound to be difficult, right? It's like calling sharp sap, yeah, as an oracle. Right? So that part is difficult. Are we more or less? Okay. So we are we are confronted with a difficult and it's complete for this class. I mean that is what makes it hard. It's not that it belongs, it's complete. So this means it is among the hardest problems in the class of computational problems of running for long time, calling an oracle from sharp P, say sharp sub. Give me the all the number of assignments that satisfies a given uh, propositional formula. So this is a this is a it's a nice uh, theorem. This result relies in the, on the fact that we have exogenous tuples. I mean, I'm not going to go into details, but the bottom line is that it's a dichotomy, the easy versus hard, and every query falls in one of the two cases. Actually, detecting if a query is hierarchical or not hierarchical is a very simple test that I'm going to show. So this the matter of fact that it just arises very quickly and we know if sharp is going to be hard or, or easy to compute. And the second case, I'm going to elaborate a bit more in the, in the case of we have the hardness. So in the second case, as I said, we have a query that is fixed, non hierarchical, not the good ones. And basically, what this is saying is that if I have a database and I want to obtain, the, I, have, I want to have a general algorithm for all the possible databases, and then uh, for the given query that is fixed, that, that returns the Shapley values for tuples in D, that is bound to be difficult. So under usual complexity assumptions or conjecture, there is no polynomial time algorithm in place here, to put here. Yeah. Uh, in the size of the input, that is the database. So every algorithm is bound to encounter hard input databases. That is the 
I, I'm insisting a bit on this because sometimes the literature is not very really clear about what is actually what you are getting. I'm elaborating it. Okay, what is a hierarchical versus non hierarchical? Uh, and actually, as I just said, it's a very simple syntactic test. Q is hierarchical if every two existential variables, x and y, for them, the following happens. The atoms that contain one of them is contained in the set of atoms that contain the other, or the other way around, or they are disjoint. I'm going to show an example. This uh, hierarchical query. What are the, we have, here we have three variables, x, y, and z. The atoms that contain x are these two. The atoms that contain y are this one. And the ones that contain z is only this one. This, this is contained here. Yeah? And this is contained here. And these two are disjoint. Yeah? So that is hierarchical. As you see, it's a very simple test. Syntactic test. Are, are we fine? This query, that the same, almost the same I had before, but I mean here I started with uh, uh, with this one with the Saint John. Well, I don't want to have Saint John, so I replace this R by T. Uh, so in this case, we are here. So in this case, the atoms that contain X are this these two. Those that contain Y are these two. This is not contained here. This is not contained here. So and they are not uh, disjoint. So this is non hierarchical query. So this is a query for which we know this problem is bound not to have an easy solution. Okay. Are we fine? Uh, so there are two situations. This problem is easy or hard. Yeah, it is easy when this query is hierarchical, like this one over here. It is truly hard, intractable when this query is non-hierarchical, like right here. And there is nothing in between, of course. I mean, one of the two cases will always happen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is e easily syntactically testable. I mean, there is uh, nothing complicated about it. <clears throat> Actually, it is very interesting to, 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 to see that this has exactly the same tra criteria for query answering or over probabilistic databases. The result that have been obtained by Dalby and Such in 2004, probabilistic database of the kind I presented this morning, yeah, is exactly the same cases. However, we need new proof techniques. I mean, we couldn't reuse any of the, 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 the techniques they use for their results. Uh, uh, so we have to come up with something different. Uh, however, there are some very recent results, I mean, that uh, show some unifying uh, things, I mean, uh, by Deutsch, uh, Michel Monet, in Lille, uh, that they have found very recently some results that kind of unify the two scenarios. But uh, at least when we wrote our paper, we didn't see any connection. And we have to do all the food from scratch, basically. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and the dichotomy extends to some, some summation of uh, aggregation, in this case, summation over conjunctive work. Right? Uh, because the shape value is, a, is an expectation, as I, I tried to show, and it's basically linear, so that can be. Uh, extended to summation easily, and the hardness, the hardness results about the non-hierarchical queries are really extend to aggregate non-hierarchical queries as well, with for max, a minimum, and average. That is what we given the pay. So things are not going to be much better for aggregate queries. So what to do in hard cases? Of course, because I mean this is very uh, hopeless. Uh, for, uh, I mean, fortunately, we were able to come up with uh, approximation results, good approximation results, which is not always as, uh, possible, as I will tell you later on. Uh, so approximation, for example, we, we have a approxim good approximation result for every fixed Boolean conjunctive query Q, yeah. in particular non-hierarchical, the bad ones, 
that is a multiplicative, fully polynomial, randomized approximation scheme. Yeah? That, that's what it's like to do. This is an algorithm that is going to be the approximation that depends on certain thresholds I, 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 I take, I mean, epsilon and delta, uh, such that the result of the approximation, this is trying to compute the Shapley value, approximate the Shapley value for tau, given these two parameters. Yeah? The approximation is always going to be for every type of tau between the real Shapley value divided by this and the real Shapley value multiplied by this. And the probability that the approximation is between these two bounds is larger than one minus delta, so almost one. Yeah? That is the definition of uh, a good approximation algorithm, and we were able to produce a good approximation algorithm. And also, this, this also applies to summation. We, 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 didn't, we couldn't go beyond that. I mean, there is space, a room for making progress along a direction, but that doesn't look easy. So, this is more or less the situation. Uh, I think. Uh, uh, After we wrote this paper, I mean, there has been, there have been some applications which have been value to measure the contribution of TAPUS to the consistency of the database. That is what I started mentioning at the very beginning of this uh, this afternoon. So this is work that was done was done by Danny Kimmelfort and Esther Lipsis, basically. Uh, uh, and there are several other applications simply in, in data management, and maybe you can see this as reference. I'm not going to go too much into that. But I do want to mention something I, I, I think is interesting. There is an alternative to the Shapley value. Of course, it doesn't satisfy all the properties uh, listed by Shapley because uh, we, we, I mentioned before that the, the, the Shapley value is basically the only solution to, to the desiderata, yeah? uh, to the wish list. But this is something that is not too far. The, what is the difference here? We are not considering the order, the permutation. Basically, I consider all the possible sub indices. Yeah? All the possible sub indices. I consider sub indices that contain tau versus this, the same sub indices without the tau. I compute the difference, and this is actually very Maybe it would be much more natural uh, to come up with something like this than uh, coming up with the formula used by Shapley. But that is a good reason for, for having found the, for having the, the formula used by Shapley. So this is the so-called Tansaf index that is also used quite a lot in uh, coalition game theory, in voting systems, etc. So it has some applications, but it's something that is around and people use. However, the Tansaf index is also difficult to compute. It is also probably sharply hard in general, so as hard as the check value. But the formulation is much simpler. You basically <coughs> consider all the possible subset of players without considering the order. But the idea is very similar. So of course, it's, it's an average as before. Are we, are we, are we? OK. Uh, so we obtain similar results as for Shapley. I mean, for Tapasa from the situation, it's not much better than uh, for Shapley. Uh, but what we prove in the paper, actually, I think it was very interesting, that the causal effect that I presented this morning coincides with the mass of index. The causal effect that was motivated by causality in observation and studies, and it turns out to be the same as the mass of index. I mean, for us, it was surprising. <laughs> uh, that is very interesting, and that gives me another reason to, 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 to do this thing. Also, in fact, in this context. Okay, that's what I want to say about the Shapley value used in databases, data management. And now I want to talk a bit about the, the Shapley value and other scores in the context of explainable AI. Are we, are we on this time? So, I saw the motivator this morning some possible applications in explainable AI, explainable machine learning, and that's what we want to do now. Someone would say that. I mean, the typical database person would say that basically you have to invent uh, the G function such that it is monotonous or, uh, I don't know, uh, compute it in a dynamic programming way such that typically the, the, average, the average way to handle this would be to 
another function that as you start uh, uh, working with tuples, you are not you are going to have a monotonous value. So as you start increasing the uh, the size of S, um, after some point, uh, maybe you know that you can prove the computation. That's yeah. a priori principle. Uh, yeah, no, 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 actually, first of all, in the, the query, if, if it is conjunctive, it is monotonous. The other thing is, in order to do the tractability of the result, we did use a uh, dynamic programming. <laughs> but it doesn't, unfortunately, it doesn't work when we have no hierarchy of value. But uh, you are on the right track. <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, one would expect that uh, if you see it like this, you have to try all the possible essays. Yeah. Then you need some power way to prove this if something. Yeah, you, you have to kind of stop the calculation. Yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah. Someone would invent it. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, we have a, that's a good insight. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, we have applied so far a responsibility scores based on actual causality to explanation for outcomes from machine learning classifications. Something I have been doing for some time. Uh, uh, what is interesting here uh, is that we don't know, we don't need to know the internals of the classifier. Yeah? Basically, all we have to do is play with the input-output relation of the classifier. We don't care about what is inside. Of course, the natural question, what happens if you do know what is inside, maybe you can do better. Right? And I will say something about that later on. Okay, but they can be applied without knowing the internals. It can be a very complex model in particular. So we, the, uh, in this case, uh, the, the classifier is going to be treated as a black box system or being a black box system. And, uh, for, example, uh, for example, a very complex neural network that you don't, it's such a mess that you don't understand what's going on inside. Yeah. So only the input-output relation is needed. Yeah? So we, in a paper with uh, Dan Suchu, uh, we, uh, um, we experimentally actually compare responsibility scores with other local attribution scores. Uh, local, because locals in this case, I want to explain the result for a particular entity. Yeah? I not want to explain in general. I have an entity, the guy who applied for the loan at the time and was rejected. I want to explain for that guy yeah? why the loan request was rejected. That was what I mean by local. Yeah. So uh, we, in, this, uh, in our experiment, we use a sharp, uh, that is, in this case, a particular and well-established by now incarnation of explainable AI on using the, the Shapley value, the general Shapley value, but with its incarnation in uh, explainable AI, and I will show soon. Yeah. And also, we wanted to compare with the more open box models, and we can use uh, kind of a couple of logistic regression, connected logistic regression models. Uh, it was an open box model, so to say, uh, with FICO data, financial data. And actually, it was interesting to see that uh, we obtained very good results using, for example, responsibility scores and, uh, in a modified way with respect to what presented this model. Uh, and also with with chat. Right? So that is how we started working on this uh, this area of explainable AI. Okay, let me say a couple of things about responsibility. Then. So we have in the context of explainable AI, we have responsibility score, and we have the possibility of using the Shapley value in its sharp incarnation. Okay, I'm not going to talk about the open model for FICO data. I think it's very ad hoc. Was just for experimental result. Okay, so just for the gist, I mean, it's not going to be this. So we have this uh, the classifier, the black box. Uh, we have a, an entity that is requesting a loan, and the uh, classifier labels this entity as no, 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 no loan rent. Yeah. So this is the uh, same guy I had uh, this, this morning. I mean, we have different feature values, and for this uh, collection record of feature values, we get the answer no. So we put the stop playing with counterfactual version. For example, I change the, the age from 18 to 25, and then I get, yes, maybe this guy was too young to, to, to get the phone. 
uh, even with that salary, as you mentioned this morning, uh, uh, or a double prime, I could change maybe the salary, increase the salary, and get them, make me move from Harlem to Brooklyn, and now it's yes. And, yeah, this kind of change yeah. and changing feature values. So for the, just for the gist, I mean, we can, we, if we think in the same way we were thinking this morning, I could say, well, maybe H is a, is a counterfactual cost, yeah, for the label no, that we want to explain, uh, with the explanatory responsibility of one, because you are changing it, only that H uh, produces a change in the label. Okay. In this other case, it seems that I need at least two changes, so I could say maybe, this salary has a responsibility one half for the, the value of the future income for this particular guy has a responsibility one half. Yeah? Because it needs additional continued change, for example, moving uh, him to, to Brooklyn. Yeah? Okay, but this is a bit naive. A bit naive in what sense? I mean, if you think of it, it might be the case. Uh, if I change from 18 to 25, I suddenly change the label. But if I change uh, 18 into any other possible age, I get this, I still get the, the, the label no. So how important is the change in this case of that particular 18, I mean, as an age? So maybe we should consider other possible values. I mean, so it's taking something like an expectation or an average of labels that we get by changing that attribute value. Would be a bit naive to consider this way. So you need labels instead of creating others. The young or you want to reduce the, the domain of values? Am I, am I, I, I want to consider the whole domains of values for each feature. Yeah. Yeah, I but don't, this is I don't want to change it. only 20, 18 to 25. I want to change 18 to 17, 18 to 50, 18 to 60, ah, okay. and see what happens. You still work with the integer. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I, I fix the domain, the feature domain, a priori. You mm. know, uh, the, the typical AI person will tell you instead of having 100 positive values for age, you have three. Like younger, middle age, old. Well, I still like to do that. I could play the same game, but maybe it's still, with the, if it is young, I get no, but with middle age and old, and here I get the yes, I still, sorry, no, and the three, yes, and I still get two against one. You know, I need yeah. to, to, to see what's going on in a more general, I mean, uh, uh, according to a more general set of possible changes. Yeah? Okay, so for binary two value features, what I'm proposing in the previous slide is basically fine because there are only two possible values. Yeah? But that is uh, not always the case. Yeah? Uh, uh, but not in the previous example where we have, they have different ages or neighborhoods, etc. So otherwise, there may be many values for a feature that do not change the label, the original line value, and not a, it's not a great explanation in that case, because most of the other values don't change the label, only a particular one does the job. Uh, and the same for features in a potential continuous set. I mean, I could, so I need to be the more careful about that. Yeah? So better is consider the average labels of the AI from the factual interventions. Yeah. The average label. Yeah. Like consider all the possible changes that I could make on a feature value. Yeah. Uh, and, and also continuously sets. I mean that would accompany that particular feature value. All remember what we want to do, we have a fixed entity, we have a, a fixed feature, and we want to explain uh, or give a, a score the value that appear for that feature in that record, that entity, is local. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, what we did, we will propose an extension of responsibility, and it will be expressed in terms of expected value, expected value of the labels that are involved. It is a bit involved in the definition. I, I, I really don't want to go into the many details. Yeah, so in what follows, I mean, just to fix the notation, F is a set of features, yeah, for income, age, location, where the guy lives, or whatever. The classifier is going, still going to be binary, yeah, yes or no. 
uh, but not necessarily the features are going to be binary. They could have several values from a domain, the given domain. So we have now a, a fixed feature uh, feature in the set of features, an entity, and this is the value that the feature takes on this particular entity. For example, for H uh, uh, on E, this becomes uh, 18, was 18. Yeah? Uh, and, uh, and we are going to assume just to simplify things, I mean, without loss of generality, generality that we got, is the label one, that the one that we want to explain. Okay, uh, so this is okay. So uh, in this case, uh, so this is about the generalized responsibility score that uh, I think could be also interesting to, to, to consider in the concept of database when we can we, we, we take out the factual interventions are changes of attribute values and you have a domain for them. That's what I want. That's what I want to. Uh, Patrick to be here, but yeah. <laughs> you will convey them. <laughs> okay, uh, so this is a feature F star. This is fixed. I mean, that this feature is the one that will, the value for that feature is what we want to explain. I want to compute the responsibility score for this feature on this entity, local. In the example, F star is salary. This is uh, uh, it's 70k, and uh, uh, it was one that they that were obtained from, obtained from the classifier. Okay, so we, this is fixed. We fix this. We want to define a local score for a fixed contingent assignment. That means I'm going to give the value 18 fixed. You see, I'm going to change other feature values. There are going to be potential contingency values associated to the 18 that I want to explain. <coughs> so changes, the changes, the changes of the company, the main one that we want to analyze. Yeah. So uh, basically I'm, I'm taking a set of features, gamma, I'm using the same notation as this morning in order to take track. F star doesn't belong to gamma because as I said, this is fixed. I don't want to change that to the moment. So I take a potential contingency set of features, that's so why I start that not belong to this set of features, and I assign to these features in gamma a, a record of values. And for each feature in that gamma, I assign a value. For example, if a location was there and I had a Brooklyn, I could change it to Harlem or to, I don't know, New York, uh, Manhattan, I don't know. So, uh, so basically, what I have here now is an entity, the original entity, where I redefine, reassign values for the features in gamma, according to this record of values. Yeah? I'm still keeping the feature that I want to explain with its original value. Yeah? So this is the entity of the changing feature values in, uh, in E according to gamma and W bar. Yeah? So this is an illustration. Gamma could be location, W could be Brooklyn, yeah, and try to explain H for example. So that H doesn't belong here. You see, the contingency, the contingent new value for location. So E location Brooklyn, this notation could be now E as originally stated, formulated. The only difference but now the location that's been reset to Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, so now it's basically this. This is the only change that I made. Are we fine? Can this? Uh, these are potential contingent sets uh, or, uh, or potential contingent changes. I don't know yet if that is going to change the label or not. I don't care because I'm going to compute an expected value actually. Yeah. So uh, we are going to assume that with these changes, the label stays the same. Uh, <coughs> so contingent change, what is the idea? The same idea we had this morning. Contingent changes alone by themselves do not switch the label or the query result alone, but only after a counterfactual change for the main feature that we are analyzing, that is F star. So that's the same we had this morning in a different sense. 
So we are assuming here that the label for E, when we reset location to group is still one, and you're just saving everything with the green uh, example. So maybe a different one could be a gamma prime, where I'm changing activity and location, assigning values to activity accountant instead of a plumber, and the location is now native level as opposed to basic level that was before maybe. And then I will go to have what the same changes, and so these changes now is still the uh, label one. Okay. okay. Now, for each of these, I'm going to consider all the possible values V or F star. F star is the feature I want to analyze. Yeah. Yeah. So in addition to this change, I'm going to change something extra for the particular feature in which I am interested. Uh, with all the fit values fixed from all the other features that do not belong belong to F star or gamma. So in this case, for example, I have this E with this resetting this value now, E1 prime would be something like uh, I'm lo the location is proving, and the salary is now 60k instead of the 70k I have, for example. Uh, and it's going to so this is what I have before. With the continuing changes, and that it is an additional change when I'm changing the salary to 60k instead of the 70 I had before. And the label uh, could be one. In this case, it happens to be one. But it could be the case that if I change the salary, keeping everything the same here, to 80, now it goes zero. So you see that I'm going to get the ones and zeros and then a collection of one and zeros, and then I can compute the average. Yeah? So basically, this is the local score. Is basically this is what it does. I mean, basically, uh, I think I don't have to go through all the, the details. But the idea is more or less simple. It's a local score that is associated to this uh, assignment over here. That is fixed. The potential continuous ch changes. Yeah. So it depends on this. That's why I call it local responsibility score because it's local to this initial contingent changes. Is basically going to be uh, one minus the expected labels that you get that we get. The expectation of the label, considering all the ones and zeros, is one minus this uh, expected label. So this is basically going to be a number between one and zero, and this is has to be divided as before by the size of the gamma, the cardinality of the continuous set. Right? That is a the main difference, but here we're considering all the possible changes of feature values, uh, uh, and that is uh, uh, something that uh, takes care of in the uh, of things in the non-binary case of uh, of feature of features. Yeah, so we have to take into account the size. And what do we do next? Basically, what we have to do in order to compute the responsibility score is well make these things better here. We want to consider all the possible gammas and assignments for gamma such that this becomes a minimum in size. Yeah? And this becomes greater than zero. I mean, different from zero. Yeah? Because we don't, we really want to change the label. If we have only ones, we are not changing only one. So this has to be one, and this has to be something smaller than one. So this should be something greater than zero. That is the only constraint. Yeah. So that is exactly what, what we do. Uh, uh, yeah. So the responsibility score for F star, the value of this feature for this entity, is going to be uh, the maximum of all these responsibility scores. I mean, local responsibility score when gamma happens to be minimum in size the difference that I have before is greater than zero for all possible gammas and Ws. And that is the generalized score. I think it's a I think it's a nice score. I mean I'm happy we, we came up with this. And actually I think it could be nicely applied to in the context of data management as well. By, by analyzing uh, counterfactual term, not only tuple deletions but also changes of active values. Okay, so the, this is actually what we apply in, in that paper that I mentioned before, where we compare responsibility with uh, the, the score. This is the score that we use. 
Uh, well, I'm not going to say much about how to compute it. I mean, we managed to come up with some kind of optimization strategy to compute it uh, efficiently, but I think we can skip this. I want to move to something different that otherwise I will not. Okay. Uh, so we are usually, some general remarks on REST, we are usually interested on in feature values with maximum scores. They are also shifted to minimum cardinality contingency sets. Uh, already, already with binary domain, REST is intractable. I have that in one of my papers. Uh, uh, so REST does not require the intenders of a classifier. Uh, it has been positively compared to other scores, like the, the, the open box, I mean, FICO score uh, of uh, Rubin and uh, Rudy, sorry, Cynthia Rudin, uh, who have been advocating for open box uh, models, uh, and with SHAP as well. Uh, and we also show some optimization uh, for uh, the computation of RAS. Uh, a question that is open. Not addressed far, but I think this is it. Can we compute responsibility faster when we know the internals of the classifiers? And I'm going to show you that we can do something like this, like the most here or sharp. Because we want to have some time to tell you about the most recent research that we have done. So this kind of research was done for sharp, and I'm going to tell you a bit about this. But for rest, it is completely open. If someone wants to do research, it's an interesting problem. Uh, so sharp scores. Let me go back to now sharp score. There, are, everybody talks about the sharp score. People are using sharp score in the industry. There are many implementations, uh, despite the criticism by people like uh, Joao Marquez Silva uh, in Toulouse. I mean, they are all used. <laughs> they are used. I mean, uh, uh, so uh, and they they are going to stay around for. For some time. So, sham scores are nothing but an incarnation, a new incarnation of the old good sham divider. Yeah. Uh, so, we have a set of players, F, that contains the features. Yeah. We want to obtain a scores for the feature values. They are always local relative to a classified entity E, which is the same situation as before. So, we need an appropriate Game function that depends on the entity at hand because that's the one we want to, to explain. Yeah? Uh, that maps subsets of players to real numbers. That means we need a game function. Okay? So, what comes next is a particular instantiation of the Shabby value. So, this is the game function that was uh, proposed by uh, Lee and Bloomberg, who came up with this Shabby score. 2017. Yeah. So we have a set of features now. E of S is a projection of the entity on S. Basically, it's yeah, a restriction of the entity to uh, the, the features that appear in S. Yeah. So the game function that is associated to this E that is fixed given for a given set of features is going to be the expected label. The expected label. Uh, over entities that coincide with E of E S. I mean, this I can see all the possible entities uh, in the entity population whose values for the features in S coincide with those of E. Yeah. I take a set of features and repeat, I fix those values, <coughs> and I get all the other values for other features vary in their domains. Yeah, and then I will get different labels when I make them go through the classifier. I compute the expected value. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it is. Uh, so now all I have to do is take this and plug this into the formula for the Sharpe value, the general formula. Nothing, nothing uh, new. So I have a feature, a uh, fixed feature at star. And we are going to compute the Sharpe value uh, relative to this for this particular feature associated to this game function that depends on the entity at hand that is very important okay, uh, over the whole set of features. Yeah? So this is the set of features from which I take these sub, uh, sub teams of players. 
So this is exactly what I had before. I didn't change anything. And here I have the game function with S, with F star, and here without F star. That means I'm considering here all the possible entities that coincide with the original entity for the given set S features and also for F star. When I didn't change here the 18, that was the age of the guy who don't think I want analyzing that. And in this case, the same, all the possible entities that coincide with the uh, feature values for the features in the set S. Exactly the same situation had before, the difference of, the expected difference, basically, of length. Yeah? Okay, so this is the, the SHAP, the famous SHAP score. There are many other variations now, I mean, but this is the original formulation. So SHAP score has become quite popular. As I said, it was introduced in 2017. Uh, and of course, when we talk about expected values, there must be some underlying probably the distribution of the entity population. And that is a contentious issue that is not always easy to handle. In particular, application in industry, they, they express concerns about where do we get the probability from, right? But so this is not a, a minor issue. Okay. okay. Of course, if you take a look at this right away, as we did before, I mean, this is bound to be exponential time because you can see all the possible subsets of the set of features. So this is going to be exponential time if we proceed naively. Yeah? Just taking all the possible records that we don't factually can generate and then make them pass through the classifier, that is going, it's bound to be exponential. So that is no, no, no way to do, uh, to do anything, yeah? Uh, may, may end up considering exponential by many combinations. A multiple passes through the black box classifier. So can we do better with an open box classifier? That, that is the, I think what I'm going to tell you now is quite interesting. Uh, <coughs> now instead of having these blocks, I have a decision tree for them. Something like this, a typical picture taken from the book from Mitchell. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I very easily know how to classify things. I mean, if I, it was about Playing tennis, I think, with different weather conditions, right? I mean, yes and no. Yeah. So, can I use. to be of exponential time? Uh, what if we have a decision tree or a random forest or a Boolean circuit? Things like that. That's a very important question. Can we compute SHAP in polynomial time? So that is the question that was somehow hanging in the air. I mean, for some time, uh, the conjecture was that, yes, it's possible. Actually, Lundberg wrote a paper apparently showing that it's possible. I don't know anybody who understands the paper. I mean, <laughs> so basically, we, we threw it away to be sincere. Nobody understands that paper. And actually, I think uh, someone proved that that was wrong. <laughs> okay, so we will start from scratch. The famous paper by Gauss, wrote it in Latin, and nobody had the methodology. That's true. Back then, you had to love it and drink and stuff like that. And it was reinvented, you know, 100 years later by someone else. Who we never understood the Latin. So, yeah. <laughs> the paper is not understandable. It is not written. Yeah, yeah. But in this case, it's even worse. I mean, it was, uh, nobody understood it, but now uh, actually the result that it has cannot be true. Yeah, yeah. So, we basically we just started from scratch. So, can we compute chap in polynomial time when they have uh, an open box classifier? Of course, not necessarily. You can have an open box neural network, but if you don't understand the hard wiring, I mean, you're going to go very far. So, uh, so we investigated this problem in details. I'm mean, talking about the AAAI 21 paper with the Marcelo Arenas, Pablo Barceló, and Miguel Monet. Uh, we identified tractable and intractable cases with algorithm for the tractable cases, and we investigated. Uh, 
good approximation algorithm. The bad news that is nothing, no, no good approximation algorithm. We can prove it is not possible to approximate the bad case, the intractable cases in any way. But only bad news, but probably. <laughs> okay, so let's concentrate not on that. Forget about approximation algorithm. I mean, it is established that it's not possible. Okay. Of course, in order to attack this problem, how can you attack the problem? You want to prove that for certain class of classifier, you can compute sharp equals over time. And we managed to do that, but in order to investigate the problem, you have to come up with the right model. And also an interesting model, I mean, right? That encompasses different kinds of classifiers that are relevant in practice, because otherwise, but it also at the same time should be relatively easy to analyze and to investigate. So we consider Boolean circuit classifiers. Yeah? So they are basically well, Boolean circuits. I mean, they are like propositional formula. Yeah? Here you have the the inputs. These are the features x1, x2, x3, x4. They have values one or zero. We consider only the binary case, uh, and then you propagate the values, and then you get the label from here, one or zero. Yeah? Uh, so proposition of order with a binary output k. And it's not any circuit we're going to see. Uh, so it was known already that sharp is intractable for monotone to CNF classifiers. I mean, I'm talking about formulas that uh, basically are mod propositional formulas that are in conjunctive normal form with at most two literals per, per clause, and they have the same sign in there. No, it is very a bit surprising. Yeah, but yeah, here that can be traced back to an old yeah. yeah, yeah. So we have already restricted the law. Yeah, yeah. And so that means we were threatened. By <laughs> we were two were cornered. So we have to run. Why is that good? <laughs> yeah. So that was no was not to be. Yeah. I mean, one can prove that chat is intractable, but that comes from a different result that has to do with that kind of. Classifier, but actually they look very innocent, right? Conjecting normal form with two liter of a class, class monotone. I mean, what would be easier than that? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So it had to be a broad and interesting class of Boolean circuits. Not any Boolean circuit would do, uh, as I just uh, show here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the situation is that they have now features, they are all uh, Boolean features. Uh, we have the entity population that is a record of length n, the B -E, e that I had before in both ways, uh, just a record of zeros and ones and length n, and the label is also binary. Uh, com com the situation complex enough. I mean, that it can be extended to other cases, but this is the, the right uh, situation to investigate. And we assume there is also probability distribution on the entity population. I will come back to this uh, because of it's not a minor issue. But we have the probability distribution on the entity population. Could be the uniform distribution, for example, that assigns one over two to the end to, to all the records. Uh, so uh, this is again nothing new. All I have here is the formula for the Shapley value using, the only thing I'm using here is, well, it's the same I had before. The L is the label that you get from the circuit. So I haven't changed anything. The L, the label is obtained now, in this case, from a Boolean circuit. Yeah. Uh, so just to, to refresh uh, your mind about what we are dealing with. So it depends on E and depends on L, of course. But, and it depends on the classifier and the entity at hand because this is the same EA that everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we are going to call sub L the set of all the entities in the population that have label one. Yeah. So these are the satisfiable circuits, satisfiable propositional formula. Yeah. Sharp sub is the same as always, it's the number of evaluations that make a circuit true or a composition of formula true. The number of evaluations that make it true. So this is about counting the number of inputs that get label one. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, 
we know that it's hard. So the first observation is the following. What is the connection between sharp sub, that we know it is difficult, and the sharp score? If we gain some knowledge about the connection, that will give us some light, or maybe some hope. Or, yeah. So we established that sharp is at least as hard as model counting for the Boolean circuit. Yeah, this same. For the uniform distribution, no, uniform distribution on the entity population, sharp sub, that is now known to be difficult, can be reduced to this expression that is can be evaluated in terms of the sharp score. So obviously, if sharp score is easy, this is going to be easy. Sharp score is easy. Completely sharp score is going to be easy. So that tells us something about what kind of circuits we can consider. Are we fine? Can you say okay, what well, this is hard in general? So if I manage to compute this in polynomial time, this will be polynomial time. So it, it cannot be any any circuit. This would be we have to impose some conditions, some constraint. That means what we have is sharp sub that is known to be a difficult basis for the number of time reducible according to Turing reducibility because it's one too many uh, uh, calls for computation of sharp. Yeah? So it is not easier than sharp. So when sharp sat is hard for the Boolean classifier, sharp is also hard. That is what the teacher like. This is hard, this has to be hard. Uh, so negative corollary computing sharp score is sharply hard because this is sharply hard for linear perceptual classifier, uh, Boolean classifier defined by monotone 2 DNF or monotone 2 CNF, what I mentioned before. Uh, that is, uh, as I said, the result of the back from uh, it can be traced back to Google and 1983. But we merged in this context. So, can we do better? With other class of binary classifiers that are not of this kind, for example, that looks very, look very innocent. Other class of Boolean circuit classifiers. Okay, now this is the class that we decided to, to analyze. Yeah? It, it, uh, we are going to show that for this class of classifier, we can compute chap in polynomial time, and this class also encompasses some very interesting. Classifier. Are we are you with me? Uh, sorry, uh, no, it's a bit heavy. But... Okay. Well, I, I, I forget the, the pros. This is uh, the kind of circuit. Deterministic and decomposable. What do I mean by that? Deterministic means that uh, if I go into a, an OR gate with two inputs, it is never possible that the two inputs uh, are simultaneously true. Yeah. So the structure imposes a condition that only when you go into an OR gate, only one of the input can be one at a time. The input would be zero, but if you have a one, the other one cannot be one. That is the deterministic. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, is and the composability means that when you reach an AND gate, the set of variables that hang from that gate is disjoint from the class of uh, variables or features that came from the from the other side. So here I have x1, x1 doesn't appear here. Here I have x2, x3, x4, they do not appear here. So I can basically split this. And that is useful for the computation of efficient computation of the I mean, I mean we can forget the pros I and mean, this is again this idea. Uh, the termination and decomposability. That is a uh, crucial for what follows. Uh, so the rest is just explanation of what I just showed. Uh, so we concentrated on this class of circuits, I mean, decomposable and deterministic Boolean circuits. And for this class of circuits, computation of sharp equal normal thing cannot be discarded or precluded, at least a priori. Uh, and actually, uh, for this class of Boolean circuits, we find efficient knowledge compilations 
for many interesting uh, other uh, uh, classifiers. You can basically, precision trees can be mapped into these Boolean circuits, this class. Or the binary decision diagram. They are all uh, classes of uh, Boolean models that are quite useful in, in many areas of artificial intelligence, uh, in the area of knowledge compilation. Uh, Sentential decision diagrams, I don't know if you have heard about them, but they are really very popular I mean, in verification, uh, in, in, well, in AI in different areas, model counting, etc. Et uh, deterministic decomposal or negation on our form. Okay, so these are well established classes of binary models. Yeah? Uh, so, what I'm trying to say. It is good. I mean, it's a good class. I mean, it contains some very good classes. I think. Actually, and the reduction is in polynomial time, so you can you do not create additional high complexity uh, by, for example, taking an addition three, translating it into a decomposable deterministic binary circuit, and do, 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 doing, do, doing all the analysis of sharp, for example, on the circuit. <laughs> Conjunction, so it's only conjunction, right? Decision tree has only conjunction, right? Nothing more. Uh, Every branch is a conjunction of. Okay. And, and then we try. So basically, every branch is a line. And you have a disjunction of the branch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have, you have every variable to be. Every variable to be only once. But if you can, I mean, if you, if you use it, maybe you can factorize. If I have time, I will show a, a, a slide about decision trees and this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, then they try to get a big, big picture. Yeah, because, uh, sorry, but obviously we have a decision tree in mind. And uh, we're thinking in terms of decision tree and not in terms of Boolean circuit. That's yeah, why yeah, yeah, sure. we are doing yeah. the discussion. I fully understand that uh, we identify a class of Boolean circuits that give us hope yeah, that include, by a polynomial time compilation, other Boolean models and decision trees. Uh, uh, and this Actually, it's quite relevant. I hope I will be able to show something about this last part, if this kind of models that maybe you are not familiar with. Okay, so uh, so the first things that we prove is that for this kind of circuits, sharp sub C can be computed in polynomial time, and that's a good start, right? Remember, we know that if sharp sharp sub is difficult. Sharp cannot be Right. Well, at least we are we start we are starting with the right foot. Huh? Okay. So sharp. Yeah. But that this doesn't imply, of course, that the same applies to sharp because uh, it goes in only one direction. If you remember, sorry, let me. You know, it it goes only in one direction. This is difficult. This bound to be difficult. Yeah. But uh, if this is easy. We can do it on normal. Yeah. Okay. But this uh, it gives us hope. <laughs> okay. uh, uh, well, I'm not going to talk about the proof. Basically, a bottom up procedure that inductively computes uh, sharp SAT and is using the decomposability and, and uh, determinism. Uh, okay. So, uh, I'm going to skip the, the, the rest of the slide. We assume the uniform distribution. I'm going to say a bit more about this later on. Uh, uh, so uh, this can be forgotten as well. Uh, we don't need this. Uh, uh, what is we need is this theorem. Okay. Theorem, uh, sharp can be completely in polynomial time for the deterministic and decomposable Boolean circuit under the uniform distribution. Actually, we can extend this result to the product distribution. We assume that the features are independent. Uh, uh, 
Uh, okay, so sharp is computable for another time in this case. Uh, uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, by a polynomial time transformation or compilations under the uniform product distribution, sharp can be computed polynomial time for decision trees, ordered binary decision diagram, plantation of decision diagrams, diagrams, and these realistic and decomposable negation normal forms that appears in many appear in many applications in, in, in the item. Yeah. Uh, actually, we, we, we have a very nice algorithm for computing sharp. Uh, for, for this uh, class of deterministic uh, decomposable circuits as well. Yeah. Okay, decision tree says for the gist, uh, you, okay. Uh, compiling binary decision trees into the, our class of uh, circuits is an impactive construction is started from the bottom of the decision tree. So the leaves of the decision tree become constant binary gates in the, the decision in the, the, in the circuits. Uh, so in, in our circuit, we can have contents as well. So uh, an input that is fixed to one or fixed to, to zero. <coughs> uh, so uh, anti contraction is by induction, basically. I want to transform this uh, decision tree into a, a circuit. Yeah? So basically, we start, for example, in this case, I started uh, taking uh, an, an five. Five, for instance, five. Uh, for example, this one. Yeah. So basically, uh, uh, the, the final circuit is the, the is what we construct for this top node over here. So basically, we go from the bottom on the way up. Right. And this is the, the portion of the circuit that corresponds to this this part of the circuit. So for this part of the decision tree. For this part of the decision tree, we compute this <coughs> subcircuit. And you want to continue going up, well, I have to do this the same for this one, it will be somewhere here, and then it's going to be connected with the, with, with the same thing that we obtain for M7. And you see, all does appear again in the, uh, yeah. So this is uh, the compilation step. It's uh, you start from the bottom all the way up, I mean, uh, in an inductive manner. Yeah. So this, this can be done. Yeah. Uh, so the final, the final uh, circuit it will be the one corresponding to the top node. That is the for the gist. Yeah. Uh, this is computable in linear time. Is it easy? Uh, beyond binary features, well, I mean, like you can binarize. So yeah, I think uh, let, let me skip this uh, because I want to show something that is. Uh, uh, the polynomial time algorithm can be applied to order binary decision diagrams that I also, they are relevant for several reasons in knowledge compilation, as I mentioned before. Uh, in particular, they can be useful, and that is uh, relevant, to represent opaque, opaque classifiers like uh, new binary neural net networks. So binary neural networks can be represented as of these OBDDs. That is work done by Tarvish and you know, collaborators. It is a very nice uh, work. Uh, just for the, for the gist, they are very compact Boolean circuits, uh, Boolean models. I, I wouldn't say Boolean circuit because uh, they are not like a Boolean formula, but they compactly represent a Boolean function. Here I have a Boolean function, you see, that can be represented this way if you want to, that's like a decision tree. Well, it can be represented by the of these OBDDs. What is the idea of OBDDs? You can make decisions right here, you get reaching labels zero or one. But the, but the order means that whenever you find a path, the variables in all the paths appear in the same order. Wow. Yeah. Order binary decision. Yeah. Uh, decision diagram. Sorry, diagram. This is not a decision tree. But they are very compact because you reuse uh, nodes. I mean, they are quite useful, in fact. So you can use, for example, this kind of uh, OBDDs to represent neural networks, binary neural networks. Uh, okay, uh, and this is the last thing I want to show. Okay, we, we managed to obtain this, uh, I think it's a nice result about this uh, chart computability for another time. So what I decided to do, I don't know, was, well, let's try to use this 
in order to compute chap for binary neural networks. Yeah. Binary neural networks, they do not fall into the class of models that can be efficiently compiled into uh, our class of Boolean circuits. So, but still, this is worth trying and see what happens. You know? Uh, so binary neural networks are commonly considered black box models for all practical purposes. They can be very complicated. So uh, and na naively computing shaft on such a network is going to be complex. So better try to compile the binary neural network into an open box Boolean circuit where shaft can be computed efficiently. Of course, you may want you you have to be willing to pay cost. I mean, because due to the translation, to the compilation. But maybe the cost is not that high, considering that you are going to use the resulting Boolean circuit many times to provide all kinds of many, many explanations, because it's the same circuit. I mean, it, it doesn't depend on the input, it depends on the classification model alone. So you want to go and compute, I mean, one million times, explanations one million times, I mean, maybe this worth spending time I mean, producing the, the classifier. So we have experimented with chap computation with a black box by the neural network and with its compilation into a, a, a deterministic and decomposable Boolean circuit. Even if the compilation is not entirely polynomial time, it may be worth performing with one time computation, it's only one time computation, particularly if the target uh, circuit will be used multiple times, as in the case of the uh, and I will you say this in the light of an example to finish this uh, heavy packed presentation. I'm sorry, maybe I'm going to. <laughs> okay, so here, here I have this is the kind of a case we are going to use, and basically, this stretch of function, functions and nothing new. It is one minus one. It's easy to work with one and minus one, I mean, instead of one and zeros, uh, it's just technical. So the BNN, this is my network. I have uh, four. Uh, basically gates, right? Uh, I have the three input variables here in this case. This BNN can be described by means of a propositional formula, which is further transforming and optimizing to conjunctive formal form. So basically I can represent this <coughs> by the neural networks as a propositional formula. Yeah. This is not in conjunctive normal form, but I can translate this into conjecture normal form. Actually, what we do, we don't do this in this naive way. We start producing the conjecture normal form along the way, because otherwise you can create a monster of a formula that would be too large. Actually, that is the most expensive part of the compilation. The, the formulas grow too much. So we have to keep them under control. We have to use sub solvers in order to keep simplifying the formulas along the way. So there are some tricks that we have to apply, but basically, this whole thing can be represented by this conjecture normal form. And this in a formula conjecture normal form can be compiled into a sentential decision diagram. Yeah? And that is what we are going That actually a sentential decision diagram is almost already a deterministic and decomposable circuit. So this is the heaviest part of the computation. And uh, plus one additional one, but I'm going to I'm going to explain. Are we good? I mean, it doesn't look intuitive, but believe me, it works. Uh, there, is, there are some techniques for doing this. Uh, so, and the CNF that we obtain is transformed into an SED sentential decision diagram. This sentential decision diagram associated with initial uh, minor neural network. So you, here we have basically, this is a decision diagram, but it's almost a propositional formula. This is a conjunction. So this is this and whatever is here, is this and whatever is here, and this is a disjunction. This, 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 or this, this, or this, of course, in this case, it is equivalent to x2, but this, 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 or this, and so on. And this, or this, this is true, of course. Yeah, so basically, we have a propositional formula there. And actually, that is already basically the, the composable or the deterministic decision, uh, I mean, a uh, Boolean circuit. So, this is an SDD that succinctly represents the conjunctive donor form. The, the nice thing about these uh, diagrams that I have been mentioning 
is that they are very Saxon, very compact. They come to the samples of things in a very compact manner. That's why they are heavily used in, in, in many applications. Yeah? Yeah. So you have to, to pay a price to transform the CNF into something like this. Actually, it can be a polynomial time, I'm uh, sorry, exponential time. But the exponential time is fixed parametric factor. Basically, it's a small parameter that can be kept under control, fixed parametric factor. Uh, so this is the expensive compilation step, but upper bounded by an exponential only in the three width of the conjunction normal form. Yeah. So what is the three width of the conjunction normal form? There is an edge between variables if they appear together in a clause. So in this case, <coughs> here, these two variables are going to be connected by an, uh, an edge. In that way, you create a graph. And the three width of that graph is going to be a number that in general is much smaller than the, the formula. And, and the exponential is in that three width. So it's a parameter that basically can be Get under control. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, that can be proven. So, uh, so what is the three width? The three width in general is the measure of how close to a tree is an undirected graph associated to the conjunction normal form. It's a national measure to uh, uh, apply to, 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 to graphs in order to determining how close they are to being a tree, which usually is a good thing. Okay, so basically, and then basically, as I said, transforming this into this is very, very simple. This is the final binary decomposable deterministic system on which we can compute the sharp efficient. So this is just not a random picture. It, it represents the neural network I had at the very beginning. <laughs> now I can compute CHAP, we know how to do that fast, and actually I want to compute CHAP and I'm going to possibly multiple times, so all the time I spend, all the energy that I spend producing this, well, it pay, will pay off because I will maybe use this same circuit for computing explanation for the rest of my life. Maybe. Yeah, uh, so in our experiment, we use a binary network with 14 gates. Uh, it was compiled into a circuit of the this number of nodes. Sounds a bit large. But I, I, I actually, yeah, it, it took something like uh, one hour doing that but without any optimization. It was a kind of really brutal with the implementation. Uh, uh, and these are the results. Completing the sharp score. This is in in blue, or whatever color it is, and color blind, is the computing the sharply for all the, I don't think it was something like 100 entities, uh, yeah, uh, with a black box uh, uh, classifier, computing sharp only using the input population. We also use the the circuit as a black box, because you can also use the circuit as a black box without using the structure to compute sharp efficiency. But it is a bit more expensive than using the, 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 the directly the, the neural network, but this is what we use, we spent, I mean, computing sharp score for all these 100 or so entities, and this is exponential scale. So if we don't use exponential scale, this wouldn't be visible. <laughs> I mean, it is a really impressive. Uh, so, this is a very good scale. So, this is, I think, it shows very. I'm going to present the result of this. Uh, this results in maximum. Oh, by the end of this month, in Algeria. Uh, I think it's a nice thing. Uh, in this case, we use the uniform distribution. And, and then, now, to finish, one minute. Uh, basically, well, all I want to say are two things. How can we have to investigate the role of the probability distribution in this context? Because, I mean, how can we, do, do we still obtain good results to use, for example, conditional probabilities that uh, depend on some constraints that we impose? Uh, so, that is something that has to be investigated. And the other thing that actually is related to what I just said domain semantics. I mean, 
you were mentioning today about possible dependencies about between features. Well, we would like to impose some semantic condition, constraint, uh, domain knowledge, yeah? uh, and bring that into the computation or the definition of the of the SHAP score and other scores, and also in the case of the case of responsibility. So these are two important things. Investigate more, uh, de more deeply the role of the probability distribution that we use, and also the how to bring into the picture. I mean, domain semantics. That is very important. People are. I, th I think that I'm not done much in that direction yet, but uh, I think that is a very uh, important uh, subject to look. Yeah, so, can we, if we impose the main knowledge, can, are we going to change, modify the definition, or are we going to change the computation, or are we going to change the distribution that we use? Uh, I mean, there are different ways to, to proceed. But, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, uh, is it still possible to compute things in fundamental time? Uh, uh, well, I think that, that that's enough. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry if I went to, 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 to too much uh, stuff. Uh, we are very thankful. <laughs> Can we can we escape this? Because the, what? The, the nested loop. Because the problem with, with sharp and all the is a nested two forced one inside nested one inside the other. I one say for all the possible uh, gammas, for all the possible values. Go and compute. This is inherently complex because it has Cartesian product of perfect. And the first thing that I would, you know, I don't know if, if, if it's possible or if, if it violates all these uh, nice properties that uh, you know, shuffling or whoever else uh, uh, introduced because they they. they uh, the economists, this is what they do. Arrow did exactly the same thing. Arrow became famous because he gave all these definitions of what democracy is, what uh, then Arrow theorem became huge, and this is exactly the same. Tuple says the nice properties, and then there's exactly one function that. I don't know if it's artificial such that you can say there is exactly one function that does that, or there is. Some inherent uh, value. But basically, there is a fundamental complexity in that you take the Cartesian product of all these, right? And I don't know if there is, you know, out of the box ways to think about this without having all, all these inherent complexity. So, this is a meta, yeah, yeah satellite level. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, there is one thing that I think is a problem makes the fact that I mean, well, I mean, the, 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 the Siderata, the, the wish list uh, provided by Shapley is very general, right? And so one could wonder if those properties are the right properties I mean, in, in the case of Canadian, right? So that is something that people haven't questioned much. Um, maybe Joao in, in Toulouse, uh, he, yeah, he has uh, written something technical about that, I think, uh, you know, it's relevant to consider. But I think uh, people need to think more about what is really an explanation in this context for this kind of explanation rather than having general attribution scores as proposed by Shapley. I mean, that is maybe we should come up with a different list. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, we did this one with the data, at least the database community. There was at some point a big mess about the Arrow theorem and the you know, arrows constraint and basically Haro had the nice result that it's impossible to have democracy and uh, what else? It has all these nice properties, uh, equality, you know, you have to sacrifice one for the other. So, so they were doing all kinds of problems, exactly because it is hard. So these the, this kind of things, they play well research-wise because they produce uh, papers on the papers on the papers. But they are inherently complex because exactly they try to solve things that possibly might 
دیگری کرد دو سال Yeah. 